Thank you. I uh, call the meeting to order. Um, welcome all new uh, councillors to uh, Planning South Committee uh, and welcome those who have been here before as well. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome members of the public to this planning committee, planning committee meeting today. And may I remind you that the meeting at which the public are present, although is not a public meeting. We're not expecting a fire drill this evening, so if you hear the fire alarm, please make your exit by the nearest fire exit, and we gather by the bandstand. So if you hear it going off, please leave the building the most direct route uh, that you find. Um, may I remember members to switch off or put their phone to silent? Um, and remember that when you're not speaking, make sure your microphone is off, and when you are, make sure that it is on. Um, uh, before we start the official part of the meeting, I'd like the officers to introduce themselves. So, starting on my right, uh, Tamara Dale, Principal Planning Officer in the Miners team. Uh, Robert Hermitage, Principal Planning Officer in the Miners team. Matthew Porter, Senior Planning Officer in the Majors team. Emma Parks, the Head of Development and Building Control. Felicity Thomas, I'm planning barrister. Liz DePauli, I'm the um, committee officer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, declaration of members, oh sorry, apologies, um, first night nerves. Uh, apologies, do we have any apologies for this evening? Yes, we have apologies from councillors Emma Beard and uh, Malcolm Eastwood. Thank you. Um, we need to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Um, some of us were not there, obviously, so we're banking on the uh, members who were there. Can I take these minutes as agreed? Okay. Thank you. Minutes as agreed. One thing I should have said in my welcoming speech, uh, when we are voting and we're asking for your, uh, or to, if you wish to make a, a speech please can you raise your arms away can you clearly see thank you very much okay um, declarations of members interest are there any declarations of interest okay the chair has a declaration of interest um, firstly uh, the application regarding peacock's meadow uh, i was on the planning committee at Fulber parish council that considered this and is a neighbour of mine as well. And on this instance, I will actually excuse myself from the meeting and the room. And Councillor Knowles, the Vice Chair, will take that particular agenda item. I also have another point to make. It's regarding uh, Ebsworth Cottage, uh, two public speakers. Uh, I know as acquaintance, I don't know them on a personal level, uh, and I have not been involved in that for some that development so for some time. So I don't think I'm biased and I have an open mind on that one. So they're my two declarations of interest. Any others? No. Okay. Announcements. Receive any announcements at all? The chairman of the committee? No, I have no announcements to make. No. Thank you. Okay. Appeals. There are, there are there for noting, rather unless there are any members who want to comment or make a comment on the appeals. Councillor Circus. Um, I wonder whether the officers can tell us what, how long, uh, broadly speaking, appeals are taking at the moment. And I wonder whether the officers can also uh, answer a question I alluded to at the Cabinet meeting where we were looking at the development of cons conservation areas, one of which is now certainly approved at cabinet level and one is still to be approved at cabinet level. Um, if we get to a situation where you know, the appeal is happening um, and the conservation area status wasn't in existence when the appeal was lodged, but is in existence when the appeal is heard, what status, uh, if any, does that conservation area 
then have? I suppose I'm, I'm asking really whether it has any sort of retrospective status in terms of the way that appeal will be decided by the inspector. Um, thank you, Councillor Circlis. In terms of your first question, um, it really does depend on the type of appeal. Um, some are very quick, um, the, particularly the very minor things, but also public inquiries. Um, pins have a set time frame for those, so generally they're they're quicker. It's everything in the middle that seems to take a long time. So it, it really does depend on the type of appeal, I'm afraid. So um, I, I can't give any any concrete answers there. Um, in terms of conservation area, um, it, the, the inspector will need to consider any material considerations at the time that they make an assessment. So essentially, they will look at everything afresh. So if the conservation area is then made at the time that the inspector considers that, then obviously that will carry full weight in the assessment where it might not have done when the council made the initial decision. I, I hope that helps. When I asked, uh, sorry, Chairman, to you, um, I think Barbara Childs uh, said that uh, an emerging, an, an emerging conservation area had absolutely no status. So what you're saying is, when it is made, it does have status, even though it didn't exist at the time uh, that the appeal was lodged, and will be fully taken into consideration by the inspector. Yes. Have I got that right? Yes. So if the yes. conservation area is is made at the, at the time that the inspector considers it, yeah. then they would have to consider that as part of their assessment. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Councillor Noll. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. This is just a very quick question um, regarding the appeals for the head of development. And it, it, can only, it only needs to be very brief. Um, the fast track status of an appeal um, f simply because uh, I have a parish within my ward who are very concerned about this one. This is DC 221433. Um, they've asked questions and want to know how long this appeal is going to take. So being as a fast track status, what difference does that make to normal appeal procedure? A fast track is the simplest type of development, so it's usually a householder scheme. So a, a fast track is when literally the inspector relies on the, um, the, the, the officer's report and doesn't, there's not an exchange of statements. They literally rely on the officer's report and any representations and consultation responses submitted, then they make a decision. Um, I can't give a, a direct time frame. There is there is stats on the PINS website about their average times for determination. It might not be what their targets are, but that information is available on there. I can certainly point you to it after this meeting so you can okay. respond to that inquiry. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item six, uh, DC Oblique 230701, Old Clayton Boarding Kells, Starrington Road, Washington. Um, demolition of the existing kennels and cattery buildings and structures to erect a 60-bed care home, class two and eight in number age-restricted bungalows. Associated as access, landscaping, and other works. I'd invite the officer to give a presentation on this particular uh, application. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks. Good evening, members. So, please do note that since the agenda was published, uh, we've had three updates to inform you. We've had non an anonymous letter of objection received, raising no new issues that haven't already been reported. Uh, plus concern about pressures on healthcare services. We've also received comments from the tree officer of the council. He raises no objection and has no significant concerns regarding direct impact or loss of trees of high immunity value or landscape merit involved in the proposal. We've also had receipt of a consultation response from the local lead flood authority and this will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So 
As you will be aware from the committee report, this proposal follows a member overturn to refuse in January this year. And that reason related to three issues only. These being contrary to the neighbourhood plan, the site being in the countryside, inappropriate bulk and size, water neutrality not being demonstrated to a satisfactory level. So in considering this new application, officers would remind members that regard has to be had to consistency in decision making. So as shown on the slide, the site is in the parish of Washington on the north side of the A283 and east of the residential estate of Milford Grange. In planning policy terms, the site is in countryside adjacent to the South Downs National Park. The site is accessed from the A283. Old Clayton, a grade two listed building, is to the south and outside of the application site and marked yellow on the slide. Buildings and structures associated with the kennels will be removed. These are single story and there are some pictures of the site. So the new development will use the existing site access and that will be widened to allow two cars to pass. The new two-storey care home is set at the rear of the site in the northwest corner and the bungalows on the northeast and arranged in a courtyard. Members will see on the slide that there was a pass scheme that was refused on this site but with a very different style and form and layout to what is proposed now. So in the 2021 scheme, members expressed concern about the bulk and size of the development. And then since then, the design of the care home has been revised. So through change to the elevation treatment, increased recess to the building footprint and the altered roof form with sections of lower ridges. The central core of the building is now much more distinguishable from its associated wings. And there's less extent of flat roof visible from public vantage point from the National Park. So the impacts of the current proposal on the site context and the landscape sensibilities, they've been assessed by the Council's landscape architect and the National Park Authority, and neither of those important consultees have objected. So in the previous refusal, members believed the proposal would be contrary to the neighbourhood plan. So officers have sought legal advice on the interpretation of policy one of the neighbourhood plan. So this advice upholds the officer's view that policy one supports redevelopment of the site for the type of housing that is proposed. That's provided the proposal accords with all other policies in the development plan. The important thing to note is the development plan for this area is the Storrington, Sunnington and Washington neighbourhood plan, but also the Horsham district planning framework. And policy 18 of that framework allows for retirement and care accommodation outside of the built up area. That's provided it's accessible to public transport to local services. And policy 18 also encourages schemes that meet local needs. So your officers believe the proposal does accord with policy 18. There's bus stops existing directly outside of the site and they provide access to services in Storrington, expectant of a demand from the future occupiers of the care home. There's also facilities available on site for future occupiers, reducing the need to travel into Storrington itself. And there's sufficient parking on site to accommodate need and demand. And the care and retirement accommodation offer is tailored to meeting local needs through age restriction and cascade marketing and 10% of the beds in the care home being local authority rated, all of which will be secured through the legal agreement. So the buildings on site to be removed are a low level of historic and architectural interest and they only reinforce the significance of Old Clayton, the listed building, 
in a very limited way. And as a conservation officer who raises no objection to the scheme does note the setting of Old Clayton has already been compromised by buildings of the recent past. An example of this is the Straddlestone Barn, which has almost been subsumed within the Kennels building. And this will be um, repurposed and relocated within the scheme and it's of a positive contributor towards the significance. <coughs> so at the bottom of the slide, you can see the access redesign. And as far as the conservation officer is concerned, that will retain an appreciation as historic farmstead. So as noted and assessed in detail in the report, there will be a degree of harm from the bulk and the massing of the care home from higher ground in the National Park and other vantage points. But the adverse harm will be mitigated by landscape buffers and we'll have a strong defensible boundary on the eastern side of the site, which is the most sensitive, with the views identified in the neighbourhood plan protected. <coughs> so just on some of those views, to the west, you have the site separated from the estate by a steep retaining wall, with the estate set lower than the application site. And north of that is the Milford Grange Country Park. And to the east, you have open fields and the countryside character evident in the views form part of the setting qualities of the National Park. And there are further views from vantage point within the National Park itself. So this slide here shows the most sensitive relationship between neighbours and the application site. So whilst the care home will be viewable to neighbours, the building orientations, the distances involved, avoid overshadowing and overbearing impact on residential amenities. And the cross section here demonstrates the intervisibility and the mutual overlooking that would occur between the care home and those most sensitive dwellings in Milford Grange. The important thing to note is there's no direct line of sight from the care home windows, as you can see demonstrated. So this slide shows the existing access and there's an existing refuge island across the A road to allow people to access the bus stop. The local highway authority has assessed that to be safe. And then subject to operational conditions, the highway authority is equally satisfied that the widened site access can operate safely and the highway network can accommodate traffic within existing capacity. So in regards to water neutrality and habitat regs, the proposals demonstrated that and the proposed solutions endorsed by Natural England. On other matters, there's resolution to conditions on ecology, drainage, environmental protection and groundwater resources. So just finally bringing all the issues together, and applying the pan in balance because the council cannot demonstrate a five-year housing land supply. The legal advice upholds your officer's position towards the weighting of the neighbourhood plan and the interpretation of its policy and there is compliance in your officer's view on this. And the harms arising from design revisions to the bulk and size would not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of addressing the shortfall in housing care accommodation because that is the test when there is no five year housing land supply. And that includes by way of redeveloping the previously developed land. So we've received clarification on the technical matters to do with water neutrality and the scheme overall is still water neutral. So your officer is therefore recommending the application be approved subject to the conditions set out in the officer report. Thank you, officer. Um, we now invite the public to speak on this particular uh, agenda item. And I uh, just remind the public, uh, you should try and keep your uh, speaking to two minutes. Um, and the first person is Steve Bedell. 
Thank you. Good evening and thank you. Um, my name is Steve Bedell and I'm one of the three registered directors of Milford Grange Management Company Limited. And with regards to the application, I have the following comments. We object to the scale and character of the main building and the detrimental urbanising effect of a building of its dimensions. We have an area on the, which we have on the area, which is contrary to the neighbourhood plan. Any references to visual impact and character of the new development refer to views from the South Downs National Park looking north. The proposal to fell an existing screen of mature evergreen trees will open up views of the substantial new development from the Milford Grange Country Park and residents of Heath Common. The 78 properties in Milford Grange sit within a basin created by a quarry. As John Island Way descends to its lowest point, the ridgeline of all properties from number 15 to number 78 sit at or well below the ground level of Old Clayton Kennels. Greatest impact will be on the properties who share a direct common boundary with the Old Kennels, the homes at numbers 15, 66 through 69. The height differential between these houses and the proposed care home will perhaps be best visualised as erecting a seven storey block of flats just 30 metres from your front door. This is an unacceptable invasion of privacy of existing private dwellings. We are extremely concerned the combination of tree removal, construction works and the new concrete footprint will destabilise our surrounding embankments and retaining walls and in so doing void any existing structural warranties. A structural surveyor stated, quote, risks are acceptable or can be mitigated to an acceptable level. The management company should not have to accept any additional risk. Surface water captured by our drainage system is channeled into two balancing ponds. We have invested much time and resources to create a delicate ecosystem in and around the ponds. It can be easily and irreparably damaged by the contaminants leaching from the building materials, which will be dispersed via the new deep soil drains constructed on the land beyond our track retaining walls. Further points. The developer previously suggested an intrinsic benefit of the new development will be the absence of dogs barking. Residents of Milford Grange bought their properties in the full knowledge of the proximity of the existing kennels. This benefit is rather like someone buying a home opposite a cricket green than complaining me, about Mr. the Bidell, cricket. Could you just conclude your yep, one more presentation? Point. We strongly direct to any suggestion by the developer or their agents that our park is a public community to be advertised as an attractive selling point. The Milford Grange Country Park is private land with provision for limited public access only. There is no public right of way. The management company strongly objects to this application and the one which pre preceded it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I ask uh, William Bedford? I remind you that if you could keep to the two minutes, that would be much appreciated. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, hello. I live in the most sensitive property. Uh, the previous permutation of the scheme would have had very serious adverse effects on our privacy with direct views into our window. Since that time, the developers have been in touch and have increased the height of the fence there, which I do appreciate will hopefully help a little. I'm still skeptical about this because, for example, the eaves there is completely wrong. That's not where the eaves of our house sits. And I'm worried that they've got the scale correct on this drawing. And actually, it doesn't address the larger point that this building is going to loom over our estate because of the height differential. And it's going to affect our general amenity and harm the character of the National Park. The other thing I want to note is a traffic point. Uh, this isn't really highlighted in the transport statement, but actually that junction and the stretch of road on the Storrington Road is very dangerous and it's well known locally. The transport statement itself notes that there has been an accident a year for the last five years, and yet for some reason concludes that there's no pattern of accidents here. And it will tell you that actually there is a pattern of accidents here. And it's because we have multiple accesses. We have Hempers Lane, we have the quarry, we have Milford Park, and we have the kennels. Now we're going to have additional residents and houses at the kennels. Again, the transport statement claims there'll be no additional traffic movements. But I'm asking myself, how can that be true when they need 46 additional parking spaces? Something doesn't really add up with this. The fact of the matter is it will increase traffic movements, won't it? There will be more cars entering that road, won't there? And it will complicate uh, the navigation of pedestrians, it will complicate the navigation of vehicles, and it will make it more dangerous. Compounded with that, we have Rampion 2 construction access, which will be opposite Hampers Lane, happening at the same time. Something that just hasn't been considered either by the transport statement or by this uh, officer's report. Um, the fact of the matter is, it, 
you know, it's going to increase the danger of that road. It's going to harm the character of the national park. It's going to reduce our immunity and our enjoyment of our homes. And it's going to be contrary to your neighborhood plan. And so my view is nonetheless, despite the changes, you should still refuse the scheme on that basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, okay. I'd like to invite Amanda Finnamore, please. Hello, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amanda Finnamore. I actually live directly opposite Clayton Boarding Kennels, almost right on the A283. Um, I've also Excuse me, been sorry to interrupt you, but can you sit? And use the microphone so we can all hear clearly. All right, I'm sorry. Thank you very Did much. Did you hear that or not? Sort of, but not as clear as it would be on oh, the microphone. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm Amanda Finnamore. I live directly opposite the boarding kennels. I've been a resident in West Sussex for over 50 years, so I know the area. I've also lived in Cootham, which is um, the other side of Storrington, so I'm very familiar with the whole of the area and the building that's gone on quite rightly so in many in many circumstances um i'm here to object i have i've noted that there's over 110 documents so yet nobody's asked a question why i have four particular issues that i'd like to raise at this point water usage the neutrality issue 145 litres per person is the average in the UK, and yet what's presented in the documents is something well under half of the average usage. I failed to see in any of the documents anything that actually um, allows that figure to exist. There is a comment with regard to rainwater harvesting and a need to store 35 days worth of water. In order to do that, there has to be a huge amount of tankerage and also the pumps, once they start going on that, are going to impact on the whole of the area. With regard to the comparison to the usage of water um, at the kennels, I was very interested to note that it roughly worked out at the average per person per dog that day that it was used, which is 145 litres. Um, so I think that to use the comparison of the care home using less water than the kennels is spurious and incorrect. I did note that no comparisons were given to care uh, about care homes in any part of West Sussex as to the average usage of water. I would hazard that somebody in one room 24 hours is going to use a lot more than the average anyway. Point two, highways, the transport statement, that was, um, I feel, disingenuous at best. This particular uh, statement was based on reported accidents. As somebody who lives on that road, who actually weekly walks up and down the road clearing debris from cans to bits of cars, I can assure you, I would reckon that there are minor accidents between uh, approximately uh, uh, one a week. I recently cleared, this last week, I cleared a broken and smashed uh, 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 wind um, side mirror and piece of car. Also, it's not reported in the last year at three o'clock in the morning, somebody took out completely the whole light in the central reservation. May I ask so, that you bring your um, speech to a conclusion, please? Uh, not at the minute, no. I'm um, sorry, sorry. The, the sorry. number of vehicles sorry. using the site. I've asked you to conclude your speech. I, I appreciate you that, have Mr. Two Mr. Minutes. Chairman. And you need to advise. It, it by says that. up to on, on the notes. It said up to to six minutes and at the chairman's no, discretion. No, no, sorry. If you're going to be uh, not going to stick to this, then it'll. Well, I'll, I'll sum up then. If but you could I, sum I do up, feel... please, because you're allowed two minutes to speak and you've exceeded that already. So please, could you sum up? Well, my sum up is that. Other than obviously you haven't allowed me to mention the other items, which is utility, utilities and noise assessment. I do think the documents are not complete, that they have not um, uh, uh, been correctly formatted in any way. And I would ask why, because if I was going to put my mother in a care home, I would not put her in a home on the A283 where there is no access to any, any places um, to, to enjoy and on a road that has no footpath no lighting and there's an, actually a footpath in the south and national park thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you now I'll ask martin hawthorne uh, to speak 
Uh, reminding them, you have two minutes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. At Highwood, our ethos is to seek to work with communities, stakeholders and local authorities to achieve high quality developments of which we can all be proud. We were obviously disappointed to receive a refusal back in January for what we believe is an excellent scheme on a brownfield site and which meets a critical unmet need for housing and care facilities for older people. However, rather than go straight to appeal, we've worked hard with your officers and consultees to address the issues raised by members. In summary, we've reduced the scale and bulk of the care home building and achieved an improved appearance. This is a scheme of excellent quality as the images that you've seen show. In relation to water neutrality, we support the conclusions of your officers and Natural England that the scheme is acceptable. Councillor Croker previously raised a concern about our calculations at the last meeting. We believe they're correct, but this is not an issue either way, as we have a water surplus of nearly 5,000 litres, even if his alternative approach was to be followed. We support the council legal opinion that you've had that our proposals accord in principle with the policies of the neighbourhood and local plans. Since the last meeting, as you heard, I've met with a neighbour, Mr Bedford, who spoke at the last committee, and also the Milford Grange Management Company. As a result, we've proposed an increase in the height of our fencing to prevent the possibility of any direct overlooking and to green a form of wording to cover the offered contribution for the improvement of the nearby country park. We've also worked closely with the nearest neighbour, the Fordhams, and are delighted that they're here today to express their support. That's the house on the front corner. Um, we commend your officers' thorough report and conclusions. They have clearly undertaken a comprehensive planning assessment and, in our view, correctly conclude that the benefits arising from the scheme outweigh any harms. We therefore urge you to support the proposals and approve this much needed scheme. Just finally on the traffic point, it's actually going to be a reduction in traffic and West Sussex have agreed that compared to the existing position, but obviously Matthew can do that and thank you for your time. Thank you. Ask uh, Phil Prosser. Good afternoon. I've been asked to speak on behalf of my colleague Julian Burgess from Barchester Healthcare. Firstly, thank you for allowing me to speak in front of you today. However, it is somewhat disappointing to be here again after your officers recommended approval in January. Since then, the healthcare crisis has only deepened, with more care homes closing and opening, and many of the existing homes that remain are no longer fit for purpose. Still operating in converted Victorian homes with shared facilities, such properties are not able to properly disease control especially highly contagious diseases such as COVID-19, which ravaged through these care homes during the pandemic. Whereas at Barchester, we are committed to providing best-in-class facilities to offer our residents safe environments to reside, living out their final moments so that relatives can rest knowing their loved ones are being cared for by meeting the highest standards of the Care Quality Commission. We, where we offer nursing, respite and care for people living with dementia, as well as providing palliative care and supporting people with physical disabilities and those with complex neurological conditions. The service that we provide is proven to relieve the strain on the local NHS services, which we all must try to protect. Despite the previous refusal against officers' recommendations, we remain committed to the delivery of a care home on this site, having identified a significant need in the Sorrenton area. Our needs assess them using industry recognised and CQC approved software reveals that there is a current shortfall of 274 care beds with on-seat rep rooms within a three mile radius of the site. This increases to some 583 bed spaces within a 20 minute drive of the site. Our architects has produced a scheme of the highest quality using sustainable principles. For example, we will be using air source heat pumps and photo solar photo panels. Barchester will employ up to 70 members of staff, most of whom will be from the local area, and this is a major economic benefit of the scheme. Thank you for your time, and I urge you to support your officers' recommendations for approval this time, so we can deliver this much needed specialist accommodation for your local elderly population. Thank you very much. Could I ask Colin Forum, please? Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I live in the bungalow directly next to the property, uh, to, to the Clayton, uh, the one on the right hand side. And I'm pleased to have this opportunity to support this proposal. 
Um, during the whole evolution of the planning pr um, application, we've been actively involved with um, the developers. They've taken time to come visit us, uh, listen to our concerns, and I believe they have attempted to listen to the wider concerns of the community around us. I can only speak from a personal point of view, but they were able to um, provide us with a lot of support in terms of additional fencing and reduction of you know any impact that it was likely to have on our property. And I believe that it's going to that they were, they've gone further than they would normally do in most uh, other developers in, in my experience of these things. Um, although the kennels are well run, well run the established business, there's a history of noise complaints, mostly by residents, and I'm fully aware that the local people around us, from the conversations I've had, will be very pleased to see the kennels go and replaced by something that's quieter and provides a much needed uh, amenity. The I believe the kennels will be a loss, but it will be replaced. There are lots of other opportunities for that to happen. And the care home will provide a new business with a, an array of higher quality employment opportunities to the area. As from a personal perspective, I spent the last six months um, last year nursing my father-in-law through um, end of life. And I can speak really clearly about the lack of good quality facilities within the area for those in their latter stages of life. And Barchester do provide a really quality service that is much needed. And it's important, although they're costly, there is a high percentage of, of those care home beds that will be on the NHS funded, which shouldn't be lost. And equally with the, um, uh, the number of bungalows. I believe that the developer has been able to provide evidence to negate the concerns about the water neutrality and they've reduced the size and the impact that's going to have. So I would ask you to support the scheme, providing that the developers uh, apply, apply, comply with the pre-planning and post-build requirements. Thank you very much. Just have... <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Patrick Healy, Washington Parish Council, um, and Patrick Healy, you have five minutes as a parish councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, members. Patrick Healy, representing Washington Parish Council, and also Vice Chairman of the Joint Storrington, Sullington and Washington Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group. It's only five months since this committee so decisively refused the previous application by a substantial majority. A key reason for refusal was that it was contrary to the joint neighborhood plan, having been specifically rejected during the assessment of sites on which the plan was made and voted for by the public. The detail of the old Clayton sites rejection is clearly shown in the plan's appendix as site number 34, which states, Development of the site would significantly impact upon the aims of the neighbourhood plan to retain, excuse me, to retain the green gaps between Storrington and Washington. This is a clear principle of policy nine in the neighbourhood plan and policy 27 in the HDPF. The kennels has a relatively low level of building density and transitions well within its setting. So the production of the rehashed application that we see today doesn't change the fact that the site was excluded from and is contrary to the made neighborhood plan in our view. The officers continue to advance the same argument that was rejected by this committee in January that the guiding principles in policy one of the neighborhood plan effectively outweigh all other policies and that development should be permitted on that basis, irrespective of the site having been assessed and specifically rejected in the plan. This feels like putting forward the same argument time and time again until you get the right answer. In addition to the text outlined by the officers today, policy one also states in section 412, the effect of this policy is to confine development proposals to within the built up area boundaries, unless they are appropriate to a countryside location. In the applicant's planning statement, reference 712, 
it is stated the proposal is not in itself dependent on a countryside location, which begs the question why are they not considering other locations which are more sustainable. This site, having had previous applications rejected on three occasions, plus a refused appeal in 2016, is clearly not appropriate. In a letter to the chair of the neighbourhood plan in October 2021, HDC's Director of Place confirmed that under national planning guidance, a care home conversion ratio from rooms to equivalent number of homes is achieved by dividing by 1.8. So a 60 bed care home equates to 33 homes plus the eight unconnected retirement bungalows in this scheme, a total of 41. It is relevant to say here that the planning appeal, which was dismissed in 2016, was for exactly 41 homes. This rather puts paid to the argument that because this application is for a care home, it is somehow going to put less pressure on the local environment and resources than a housing development. HDPF policy 18 provides that proposals for development which provide retirement housing and specialist care will be encouraged where it is accessible by foot or public transport to local services. The site is relatively isolated on a major highway two kilometres from Storrington and even further from the Glebe surgery at the other end of the village. There is no safe footpath and anyway, it's too far for elderly people. Catching a bus involves crossing the busy A283. West Sussex County Council, in its first response to the Rampion 2 pipeline project, describes the A283 as a very busy high-speed rural road which does not have a good accident record. It already faces a looming traffic crisis due to the pressure from the proposed Rampion routing and the infilling of Rock Common Quarry in Washington. There's been some concern that the relationship between the applicants and the officers has variously been described as collaborative and in negotiation. At the very least, this doesn't sound impartial. No such collaboration or negotiation has been extended to the parishes who invested five years in creating their neighbourhood plan. I therefore hope we can rely on members to once again vote against the officer's recommendation, which would render a made neighbourhood plan worthless and set a dangerous precedent for other speculative applications, especially given the current lack of a local plan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I would just now like to invite Anna Worthington Lees to uh, speak, and like the previous speaker, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chairman of Storrington and Sunnington Parish Council and also Chairman of the Neighbourhood Planning Group. This application contains fairly minor alterations to the bulk of the building, which we do not consider provide any significant improvement. By the officer's own admission in point 311 of the committee report, the SDNPA maintains general concern regarding bulk stroke massing of the proposed care home building. This conveniently morphs into the SDNPA having no objection. The previous application was refused because the proposal is contrary to the neighbourhood plan cited outside the built up area with development bulk and size inappropriate for a rural location directly across the road from the South Downs National Park. It would significantly impact on the aims of the neighbourhood plan to retain green gaps between communities and water neutrality was not proven. No amount of changes to the design can counteract the fact that this application is contrary to the made neighbourhood plan. The site was assessed under the neighbourhood plan procedure by HDC and specifically rejected by HDC as being unsuitable for development. None of the reasons for that, re that rejection have changed. If it was not suitable for housing, it cannot possibly be suitable for a care home for the same reasons. The site is not included in the neighbourhood plan or the HDPF. It is contrary to policies 4 and 26 of the HDPF. It is also admitted in paragraph 654 of the committee report that the proposal would impact views protected in the neighbourhood plan and is therefore contrary to its policy 8. In a letter dated the 27th of October 2021, Barbara Child stated, amongst other things, 
Old Clayton Kennels has been assessed as playing an important visual role as the landscape transitions from an urban form at Milford Grange to the attractive open rural landscape of the National Park that immediately abuts the eastern and southern boundaries of the site. The officer assessment of the old Clayton Kennel site remains as less sustainable than other sites in the parish, given the combination of landscape, heritage assets and distance from services and facilities. Again, none of these factors have changed, yet it now apparently is suitable. Paragraph 612 of the committee report states the application site is located outside of any built up area boundary and is not allocated for residential development in either the HDPF or the neighbourhood plan. Therefore, the application conflicts with policy four of the HDPF. So why is it recommended for approval? With regard to water neutrality, the applicant admits that the application as it stands does not comply, but claims to offset the excess elsewhere in Henfield. This is utterly ridiculous. How can measures outside the area subject to water deprivation possibly compensate the water will still be taken out of our system and thus the application fails to comply with the water neutrality requirements. This whole process smacks of fiddling the numbers just to get permission. Approval of this application may well be detrimental to Sussex Down, yet this is ignored. It's also stated that the staff will be local. How? When Sussex Down, an existing facility, cannot recruit enough staff at all, never mind local staff. Again, this is ignored. It is repeatedly stated that there is safe pedestrian access to Storrington Village. There isn't. There is no continuous footpath and access to Storrington or to the bus stop that serves Storrington would require crossing the extremely busy A283. This means deliberately exposing elderly people to danger. That is contrary to policy 18 of the HDPF. The officer's report repeatedly states that this application complies with policy one of the neighbourhood plan and quotes legal advice to that end. Convenient as that legal advice is, the fact remains that as chairman of the neighbourhood plan group, I know that the intention of the neighbourhood plan was to support brownfield sites that had not been assessed and specifically rejected as this one was. It is totally disingenuous of this council to now try to undermine the neighbourhood plan particularly as it was led by HDC who worded these clauses. To allow this application would not only undermine our neighbourhood plan, but it would also undermine every neighbourhood plan made or being worked on now. Why would any parish council bother to produce a plan only to have it undermined in this way? It would make the whole process completely pointless and I urge members to support their parishes and refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could turn the microphone off, please. Thank you. Okay. I will now invite the officers to, to address points raised during the public speaking. Thank you. So before I respond to those, just uh, to summarise the local lead flood authority comments that were received. Um, basically, they've identified uh, shortcomings in the flood risk assessment based on rainfall data and uh, a technical issue on micro drainage uh, quantities. So as officers, what we've done is we've gone to our own council's drainage engineer and he's satisfied that um, if that data were provided, that it doesn't change the merit of the drainage strategy and the technical solution has been put forward already uh, and wouldn't exasperate flood risk elsewhere. So the opportunity is here for utilising the conditions that are already based in the officer recommendation to resolve and update the flood risk assessment uh, with consultation with the flood authority and the applicant. And that's the common practice to resolve technical issues through subsequent discharge condition. So as officers, we're satisfied that it doesn't fundamentally change uh, the fact that 
the site layout can accommodate the surface water flood risk safely and there's opportunity for additional infiltration tanks or other uh, storage be it through rain, uh, rain gardens or otherwise to address the issues of the flood authority. Um, so in terms of the issues raised by neighbours and the parishes, just to deal with the on-site <clears throat> impacts in terms of neighbours, we have provided and demonstrated that there wouldn't be an adverse harm to neighbouring amenities and living conditions. Um, there will be a change in the levels between the sites, but for the reasons already explained, that doesn't translate to intolerable living conditions for neighbours. In terms of the highways, the Highway Authority has assessed all of the documentation put forward in the application and finds it robust. They haven't challenged the modelling for the traffic trips that uses nationally endorsed modelling systems, um, which are widely used in planning decision making and we've held, uh, upheld an appeal. And as been pointed out in the officer report, through that modelling, there is actually a reduction in vehicular trips. Um, equally, the access is found to be safe. It meets all of the requirements in terms of engineering, visibility displays, and the crossing is safe. And we've got contribution from the developer for enhancement to that, um, separate to highway requirements. This has come forward as part of uh, officers' advice about compliance with policy 18. In terms of the interplay between the neighbourhood plan and the local plan, simply detailed out in the report, the council advice, it upholds the officer's position about interpretation of policy in the neighbourhood plan. And we're in a situation where there was a site selection process through the neighbourhood plan, but that was, as I understand it, for market housing, not sheltered accommodation, and there is no allocation for sheltered or care accommodation in the neighbourhood plan. It's silent. There is no provision within it within the allocations. So because the neighbourhood plan sits alongside the local plan, the council advice is clear that officers and the council itself can give greater weight to local plan policy in that regard because that's where the provision is and also the neighborhood plan is more than two years old so it doesn't benefit from the MPPF protection yeah I just wanted to come back on one point please um, a comment was made that officers aren't impartial and um, and, and I'm sure members are aware of this, but but obviously officers are members of the Royal Town Planning Institute and abide by their code of conduct and are impartial. Um, discussions with agents and applicants are part of the practice and are in fact encouraged because if you can resolve matters through discussion, then you should do so. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I call upon the local members um, Councillor Fisher first. Apologies if I've got you. Uh, we're going alphabetically, I guess. Right. <laughs> I said we're going alphabetically, I guess. Um, well, okay, well, apologies. I'm just following my. That's okay, don't worry. So, as, um, as Horsham District Council's councillor elected to represent the residents of Storrington, Washington, I believe it's my duty to do exactly that. Sorry, so, could it? Sorry, could you speak a little closer to the microphone? Uh, oh, yeah, I should do a bit closer. Thank you. Sorry. Um, should I say let's start again? Yes, please. Okay, as um, Helsham District Council's councillor elected to represent Storrington and Washington, um, I believe it's my duty to do exactly that. 
Apart from my concerns or around the degradation of the Green Gap, um, about accessibility for pedestrians, particularly on a, a, a very dangerous path, uh, two kilometres long to Storrington, um, and uh, the use of public transport, uh, which is not um, 24 hours by any means for, uh, for home users, but also for the staff. Um, uh, concerns about the increase in traffic and the late arrival of um, an ejection from a local lead flood authority, which we only found out about this afternoon. I've heard representations from Storrington, Sellington and from Washington Parish Councils uh, speak today, and it's clear that they sincerely believe that this proposed development is contrary to the neighbourhood plan that they themselves agreed in consultation with Horsham District Council. Um, in a mandatory planning briefing, which we were given to all HDC councillors by Barris Barrister John Fitzsimons a couple of weeks back, John clearly stated that neighbourhood plans are really important documents which hold the same status as the local plan. So I am conflicted because I'm being told different things here and I'm not um, saying that. You know, that's what I've been that's what I've been told by a barrister so what he continues on to say that if you weren't to consider the neighborhood plan that would be a failure to consider a material consideration which could be challengeable I don't know exactly what's gone awry here but given that many members of, of planning south um, are expressly committed to treating neighbourhood plans with more respect, to listening to these sometimes neglected voices and to supporting local and, and parish, parish and neighbourhood plans. Um, I, I suggest that perhaps in the light of the lack of clarity and or consensus, um, members should consider rejecting the application. <laughs> uh, while I appreciate that the developers have done what they can to, to take into uh, account uh, concerns and, and I just wanted to make sure that that is an officer have done what they can again to inform us about uh, what they believe um, and so um, I suggest that they, that members should consider rejecting the application um, and that if the applicant so wishes this application can be taken to appeal which regardless of the result should help resolve the issue of what the national plan says and what its intention is and how it should be interpreted thank you thank you Councillor Fisher, could I ask Councillor Greg to uh, comment? Yeah. When the previous application for this development came to the planning committee for consideration in January, the committee accepted Councillor Dawes' assertion. For those who don't know, Councillor Dawes was a ward councillor before May, a long-standing ward councillor. Um, they accepted Councillor Dawes' assertion that the local neighbourhood plan excluded the old Clayton site as being suitable for development. And you can check this in the um, uh, the evidence-based documents for the Storrington, Sonnington and Washington neighbourhood plan. It's a site assessment report appendix two, which lists the site excluded for development for both housing and employment. So it's not just for, for housing purposes. And the proposal, um, the committee also accepted that the proposal being contrary to the neighbourhood plan due to being sited outside the built-up area boundary with the development bulk and size inappropriate for a rural location directly across the road from the South Downs National Park and which would significantly impact on the aims of the neighbourhood plan to retain green gaps between communities was one of the reasons that the previous proposal was rejected by the committee as well as water neutrality not having been satisfactorily proven at the time. So the current application changes, uh, includes changes to the care home building design, plus some landscaping changes. The South Downs National Park Authority, while welcoming the landscaping changes, noting that they help reduce the impact upon views from high ground from within the National Park, stated that it maintains a general concern with regards to the bulk of, of the proposed care home. So while the, this does not amount to an objection, it does seem to be an acceptance that there will be some landscape harms. I, I, accept, I, sorry, I accept that the care home building redesign does make it seem to look less like an institution and more a bit more like a country house or a redesigned coach house, which is, makes it perhaps look less incongruous in the landscape. 
And also the clarification of the water neutrality statement seems to resolve concerns about whether development would meet water neutrality requirements. But what remains is the issue of the neighbourhood plan. While the planning officer has explained that the advice from legal counsel is that the neighbourhood plan does not exclu exclude the development of a care home and retirement bungalows on this site, we can see that there are still strong objections from, from both of the parish councils which maintain that the neighbourhood plan does exclude the development. It seems clear that their intent when they produced the neighbourhood plan was that there would not be a development such as this on the site. It should also be noted that the current application has, well, I was going to say 12 objections, but we now know it's 13 objections recorded against it, um, mainly from Milford Grange. And I could see no comments in favour in the, in the um, documentation. Plus, there's also an objection from Milford Range Management Company, and we heard it tonight. Given the strong opposition to this development by the parish councils and by the residents who would be most impacted, I feel it's my, represent, my responsibility to represent these, these dissenting views. Thank you, Councillor Greg. I would ask uh, Head of Development to respond to that. some points raised there. Thank you. Um, I won't comment more widely, obviously, I'll wait for the rest of the discussion, but just to comment on the policy itself. Um, and as officers, you know, we've listened to the parish councils, we recognise what the intention might have been of that policy, but ultimately we have to assess what it says, what it says on the tin, ultimately. And if I can just take a second to read that for you, and I'll, I'll just read the bits in yellow. So it says development proposals outside the built up area of Washington will be supported. And then it talks about um, on any allocated sites uh, within the area and around Montpellier Gardens. Um, but then it says, or if it results in the reuse of previously developed land, tick, on land outside the South Downs National Park, tick, providing the proposals accord with other policies in the development plan. And obviously that's on the basis in which the rest of the assessment is. You have a council view before you, which is a material consideration. Our officer's view is it's pretty black and white and whilst we fully acknowledge what the parish's intentions may have been the fact is it complies with policy one of the neighborhood plan and also members must recognize that just because a site is not allocated that does not prevent it from coming forward in any event even if you did consider it was contrary to that policy which in my view it's clearly not we don't have a five-year housing land supply the neighborhood plan is more than two years old and we we are in a tilted balance situation where we have to demonstrate significant harm to override that so i think members need to be mindful of what the policy actually says before you and what policy context we are in bearing in mind our five-year housing land supply thank you Thank you, very, thank you very much. Um, I would just open to debate. Councillor Surface. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Uh, too many years in politics has made me very cynical. And uh, my cynicism tells me that what's happened here is the applicants have thought to themselves, hey, we've had an election. We've had a substantial turnover of councillors. We, what we'll do is we'll make some cosmetic changes to what we put forward last time. And who knows, we might be successful this time. That's, I, I am sure, is uh, what, uh, what has happened here. Uh, and I'm not impressed. Uh, it seems to me the major objections to this development that we looked at last time we had the application in front of us, or the last application, um, those objections are substantially objections that are valid now. Um, uh, the point was made by ward councillors um, about coalescence. Um, at the moment, uh, the, the road between Storrington and Washington still retains a rural feel. This development will do violence to that rural feel because it is substantial 
it is still a very bulky building that will look completely out of character and jar. The whole point about Milford Grange is as pointed out, it, it is in the old quarry and therefore it doesn't impact on the street scene. And the, so the character of the road has been maintained. Um, uh, uh, mention was made of the road. Um, it is an extremely fast, dangerous road. Uh, we know that because, well, anyone who knows the road knows that that's true. But I know it to be true because when I was the county councillor for Storrington, we had a tragic case of uh, an elderly lady crossing the road, being run down and killed just outside Melford Grange. Because the point is to travel to Storrington by public transport, you have to close across the road. In parts, there are no pavements. The idea that it is easy access for people uh, this development to go into Storrington is nonsense. Um, so uh, I th it seems to me there are major objections uh, to this development. Um, as for, I have to say, others uh, around this table who are, who are more skillful at issues of water neutrality will, I'm sure, deal with this. But um, the local communities that I've spoken to about offsetting think that the developers are having a laugh. And I have to say the idea that this is water neutral because of offsetting with, with water usage in Henfield sounds like a developer having a laugh. But as I say, there are others. Uh, and perhaps the, uh, it seems to me we are letting stuff through on the basis of satisfying water neutrality that to me at least seems highly questionable so i think the um we should respect the wishes of the local community nothing fundamentally has changed and i think i hope the committee will do what they did last time and turn this application down thank you thank you councillor circus any other? Um, so I can't see whose hand went up first. Uh, okay, Councillor Bateman. I just have a question, really. I'm just trying to seek some extra clarification about the traffic because we're two very conflicting, you know, statements there. One claiming that it would be traffic neutral, another claiming that it would increase traffic quite substantially. And I'm just trying to understand the basis on which those two claims are made, because they are completely poles apart in what they're arguing. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. Could I, I will come to you in a moment, Councillor Dennis, but do you want to? Yeah, so on the traffic, the local highway authority position and your officer's position is that it is being evidence-based that there won't be a significant increase in traffic trips because the modeling demonstrates that that should be a reduction from the existing use and i think the anecdotal evidence is what's been expressed by the parish and member, um, members and also neighbors but the point is the the evidence does not back up uh, that position if i can just add to that and say obviously if members were to consider there were an issue you would need an evidence base in which to justify that there is harm at watch warrants of refusal and officers views we don't have that we have an evidence base that supports it and the other thing um that of, uh, members need to be mindful of is obviously consistency in decision making as well is this application wasn't refused previously on highway grounds and whilst it is a fresh application your consideration should be has anything materially changed on site to warrant a different view or has any planning policy changed to warrant a different view or has the proposal changed to warrant a different view and the officer's view is those things remain consistent in this application and therefore we shouldn't be introducing new concerns which we didn't raise when the previous decision was made thank you 
Thank you, Officer. Uh, Councillor Dennis. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I have uh, well, been some very interesting comments made tonight. Um, obviously, uh, it's no doubt we need more care homes. With a 30% increase in the over 65s in the Horsham district only um, in the last 10 years, um, I think it uh, makes sense. However, there are some questions that I would like answered, and there's three specific ones. Um, why is it, it the bungalows are available to the 55s? You don't retire to your 67, which means probably most of us around this room could probably retire into one at this moment in time. Um, it doesn't seem relevant. I mean, the, the schemes that I'm seeing going forward across West Sussex at the moment, they tend to be over 65s at least. Um, some of them are actually even over 75. And interestingly, this particular document refers to the fact that actually um, you use, they're looking at 140 units of accommodation per 1,000 people over 75. So why use the 75, but the bungalows are available to 55? So that's nearly a generation different. Um, so that's the first comment. The second one is around the water usage. Um, I'm really surprised in this document, there is no independent figures about wind water usage, uh, care homes around the district not just this particular um, Red Oaks, as it called in, Hen in Henfield. Uh, Red Oaks, yes, in Henfield. Uh, there's been some very, very valid comments about the water would be a base, you know, the waters in Henfield that's been reduced, but where are the independent figures? And then thirdly, is around the Section 106 contributions. Uh, and one of them is about a highways improvement at the crossing on the Storrington Road and a contribution of 15,000. Well, you know, you're looking there for a crossing cost around 150,000. So I don't know where the extra 135,000 is coming from. Thank you. I will invite the officer to address the points raised. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the age restriction has come forward as part of the proposal. Um, it's been suggested that there's um, a suitable age for the market. Um, so it's age restricted enough to qualify under policy 18 um, for that reason. So there's no reason for the officers to challenge that there should be um, a, a higher threshold for the age occupancy of the longer rows. In terms of the water usage, I'm not quite sure why what we need independent figures for a nursing home. I suppose what I'm saying is you're comparing it to the Red Oaks. Yeah, you're not comparing it to an independent, a care home that's not owned by the same group within the same district or another another care home owned by another group. That's what I'm trying to feel, have a feel of independency rather than actually referring to another care home in the group. I don't think you could have a requirement for them to provide data from what is a private company that they would have no control over. Ultimately, they they may not be able to even provide those figures because it would be reliant on third parties outside of the control of the applicant. You would not normally require put requirements on planning which fall outside of the control of the applicant. I think it has been properly surveyed as we would normally expect for this kind of thing um, and, and being considered by Natural England and, 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 and being supported. And, and officer's view is that is robust enough to take the view that that is acceptable. I suppose then I would support some of the comments made by the objectors then on that one. It just doesn't feel that it, the work has been done properly on that water use. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just on the point there. of the crossing, what we're not expecting is for a new crossing, because that's not being required by the Highway Authority to mitigate or if they consider it safe. So what would the 15,000 be spent on then? Because there's already a refuge. So what we are going to be doing is negotiating with highways on warning signs, perhaps railings, expanding the refuge island race pavement or lane markings. What highways don't want is to have the road narrowed because it's a busy uh, transport route. But there are options there to, to have a look at to see whether there can be some improvement, but it won't be um, a controlled crossing because that, as you've quite rightly said is a uh, different costing completely i think if i was an old person elderly person not more elderly person i would still feel very vulnerable thank you captain dennis so oh yeah can i just remind you if you are talking please can you make sure the microphone is switched on and you're very close to the microphone thank you 
Councillor Manton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll refer to my notes that I've made. Thank you. Um, some mention was made about the green buffer preventing communities being coalesced. I'm a little unsure what's happening here because from what I can see of the site, um, to the north, there is the buffer of the John Island Way um, uh, estate between that and the, uh, and the wood behind. Um, to uh, the east um, on George's Lane, there is another quite substantial development there. So this seems to be just an isolated little square um, in the middle of this. So I'm a little unsure what is meant by green buffer in this particular case. I also heard a gentleman talk about PV, photovoltaic cells, as part of the, um, uh, the application. I haven't seen that. I'd be grateful for a little more um, information from the officers on uh, what uh, uh, PV generation is likely to occur there if it was approved. Um, as far as the mass and bulk of the site is concerned, I wonder if some of this is actually a requirement of nursing um, dementia people and wide corridors and access for wheelchairs and is in fact um, a sort of fait accompli with that kind of a nursing home. Um, if it is a dementia unit, um, is it a secure unit for dementia patients? Um, in which case I wouldn't expect to see them crossing the road and walking up into Storrington. Um, but I do take the point that is it for over 65s or not? Perhaps um, somebody could enlighten me on those points. Thank you. Yep, so in the material of the application, it's not explicit as for dementia. It is just a C2 care home, which would encompass dementia care, but also close care and other uh, more conventional uh, care home occupation. Um, Obviously, it is up to members to whether they feel that it's necessary to restrict occupation, although what we're assessing is the planning use rather than um, the micromanagement of the, the occupation, because that's within the C2 use. Um, I agree with you. I, I'm slightly unsure about the use and the terms of green gap because the green gap policy in the neighbourhood plan doesn't apply to this site. On the slide, you can see that the green gap is where my cursor is. So that's in policy nine of the neighbourhood plan. And the purpose of that is just to avoid coalescence between Storrington and West Chiltington. Um, so I think there's some erroneous use of the term there. and need to be careful because it is referred to in the green gap. Um, within the neighbourhood plan, so we need to be careful when referencing that. Um, in terms of the solar panels, there is a commitment to BREAM standard, so as part of the um, condition discharge of that, that will likely involve the introduction of solar panels and as officers we would be uh, in negotiation with the agent about where those are best suited to be uh, less visibly, visibly intrusive on the site. Um, but that's why they're not presented at this point in the application, because it will come through with the discharge of the Briam condition. Councillor Mentor. Uh, yes, thank you, planning officer. Um, so would that the PVs become part of a Section 106 requirement? Not Section 106, it would be through the discharge of the condition, because there's a condition of the permission that they have to um, provide us details of the BREAM. So, yeah, sorry, I've assumed that there's a knowledge of what BREAM. BREAM is basically um, an, a building regime which would provide for sustainable fabric to a building. So the construction materials, um, insulation, energy efficiency, it's 
now quite widely used on developments of this scale. Um, Thank you. Uh, Councillor Milne, apologies for... Thank you, Chair. I've got a, a number of questions. Um, firstly, um, uh, we have a dysfunctional planning system and conflicts between uh, the local plan and neighbourhood plans are, are almost uh, built, in, built into it. It, it's, it's, it seems unavoidable. So we, um, an objection is raised that, um, that uh, this, this uh, development was not in, was not in the neighbourhood plan. And uh, we, it's been explained uh, that this this is for protected housing, whereas that was for market housing. How I'm not aware of any of our neighbor, neighborhood plans that that specified areas for for uh, protected housing. Do we do that? Is that is that a normal thing, or, or should we be doing it if this if this is a, effectively a, a loophole um, that, that we're now exposed to? Do you want to see that question first? Sure. There are other neighbourhood plans that do, um, Upper Beading and Slimfold, I understand. But, but we have to bear in mind that, you know, neighbourhood plans and, and the Horsham District Planning Framework work as a whole. And so you wouldn't always necessarily expect one or the other to have all the details in, because if it's not in one, you're relying on the other and it works as a whole. And that's why it forms the development plan. So, yes, it's open to neighbourhood plans to add the policies in and some neighbourhood plans have. But if they're silent on that, that's where, as my colleague said, you then look at what's in the Horsham District Planning Framework. Or if that's silent, you look at the National Planning Policy Framework because they're all the development plan as a whole. I hope that helps. Thank you. So, so just to clarify, so that we do have neighbourhood plans where it did specify that this site was for protected housing only. Yes. Not, 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 no, I mean that they looked at a, a care home type of housing as part of their neighbourhood plan allocations. At different different neighbourhood plans. Okay, but it, it didn't necessarily specify a site. But that's... Uh, the sec second question, if I may. Um, uh, we've had so many uh, <laughs> frustrations with uh, judgments by highways that uh, West Sussex highways that um, developments uh, are acceptable on traffic ground or safety grounds and. Um, to my, in my four years, we've never successfully challenged one, um, and that would apply to all the statutory bodies, um, including now nat natural England on water neutrality. Um, can I ask officers to what extent it, does it happen, that, or is it possible to successfully challenge with an inspector uh, a statutory, you know, West Sussex Highways or any of the other statutory bodies, if they've made a judgment or we wish to go against it, what are our chances of um, winning that? I'm not aware of any cases where the authority has taken a different view to the county highways and been successful. Um, I, I think it's we know that the tests in order to, to find something acceptable on highways grounds is incredibly high and that's because of what's written in the national planning policy framework. It sets a very high bar in terms of what then becomes um, unacceptable. So I think to answer your other question about appeal i think we my view is we would not be successful at appeal to on highway grounds when we have no evidence to support our concerns or members concerns and i think that's key if you had an evidence base that that took a different view then that w would be part of your consideration i think what we have here is is people's opinions and and and, and we recognize that there is that local opinions there but but ultimately we don't have an evidence base and so I think that would put us in a very challenging position in appeal. But what also put us in a challenging position at appeal, as I've said previously, is we didn't raise highway concerns as a reason for refusal. And that puts us in a cost position at appeal, not just a position where we can't defend it. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good. And one more question for me. Um, the, um, you, you virtually came on to it at the end there. Would you, can you remind me? of the, um, the three reasons for refusal last time. Uh, and would you say that we really need to stick to those three grounds or do we have flexibility to consider other issues? Well, officer's view is, is we shouldn't stick to those because it's acceptable. But, but, but ultimately, um, as I said, when you're considering a revised scheme, your, your, your things that you have to consider is, is what's different about the scheme and does that materially change the view you took last time? Is anything changed on site? 
to make you take a different view or has any policies changed to make you take a different view? Now, the officer's view is, you know, generally in terms of the number of bedrooms, etc., highways impact, that, that, you know, that, 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 that rather than cosmetics, that the application is largely the same. There's no fundamental policy changes or site circumstances. So, you know, the focus of members' consideration should be what the reason for refusal was at the previous meeting and whether they have been addressed or not. Thank you. And the, the three reasons were last time? It, uh, the neighbourhood plan, whether it complies with the neighbourhood plan or not. Um, it, uh, contrary to the neighbourhood plan, the site being in the countryside, uh, inappropriate bulk and scale and water neutrality. And obviously it's officers' views that those matters have been satisfied. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you, Chair, for allowing me multiple questions. We'll come to you in a moment, Councillor Dahl. But you had your hand up, Councillor Trott, did you? Uh, yeah, I think uh, to have a little bit of clarification, please, on uh, John Milne's point. Um, a lot of a lot of my thinking is is part of the usage of this site, and 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 the concern I would have is is what if, for example, they decided not to have this for uh, elderly people, but instead for young families the change of usage and then suddenly things like the highway becomes ever more important particularly if as part of this planning application you're not able to affect any changes in terms of the highways so is it possible to put in the condition that the site can only be approved for this population uh, moving forward and can that be a guarantee um, if you look at the description of development, so on page 15, um, the description of the development is a 60 bed care home, which is a C2 use and eight age restricted bungalow. So that is what you're considering. If they were to do something different, that would require a separate consent. So by the nature of the application that you're considering, it is restricted to that in any event. They couldn't just put families in there. They would have to come in with a fresh planning application to do that. And in terms of highways, you know, you need to consider it on the basis of what you have before you today. And obviously we won't discuss that further because there's been lots of debates about highways. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think, I'm not sure who put the hand up first, but Councillor Noel. And I'll come to you, Councillor Greg afterwards. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was one of the councillors sitting on this particular um, uh, application uh, early in the year, and uh, I do recall that the three reasons were that it was contrary to the neighbourhood plan. Uh, it was uh, to do with water neutrality and obviously too much bulk. Um, as seen from South Downs National Park. That was certainly why I objected anyway. Uh, I, I do feel that a lot of these, or at least two of these uh, issues have now been addressed to a certain extent. I'm certainly a lot more happy with water neutrality. Water neutrality has to be, uh, has to be addressed in, in, in every single application and there are obviously ways that these these issues can be addressed and, and and one is offsetting as i've said before i'm not totally happy with offsetting because i'm not sure of of, of how it can be not only administered but checked at a later date however um, by precedent we have accepted various forms of offsetting in the past and therefore we have to for the moment uh, somehow get round offsetting, uh, sorry, water neutrality where we can. The one remaining objection, as far as I'm concerned, is the bulk and massing of this. Um, when we were being shown the slides by officers at the beginning of the presentation, we sort of whizzed through the visuals, uh, yes, back there from the South Downs National Park. It's the South Downs National Park, which is, which is the reason that uh, the bulk and massing were considered to be too large. And uh, I'd rather hope that although um, it has been changed and that um, it's, it's, it, it certainly looks a lot better from the ground, 
I wonder how it would look from the South Downs National Park. So could we again see those slides? I'm going to have to turn away from my microphone to have a look. Um, no, the, 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 what the, I'll do, the views, please. Yeah, I'll run through just the slides to make sure I'm capturing the ones that you are referring to. So do you mean this view here with the new no. roof scape? No, 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 no. The view from the SDMPA. The, the SDMP, right? Okay, so the protective views in the national park policy. So but I thought I thought you had some scenic views. So these views yes, are yes, the yes, longer yes, views yes, yes. from the applicant's landscape visual assessment. Um, the reason why this has the particular supporting document hasn't been updated is that from what you would obtain from vantage point from the National Park, the, the roofscape is an improvement because that's what the National Park Authority has, officer has said that. But in terms of kind of the, the overall outcome, it's uh, an improvement, but it won't materially change these views. Is that what you after? Yeah, well, it's it's going to be very subjective, isn't it? Whatever we decide on the on, on the bulk and massing and, and views from a distance. So uh, there have been concerns about green areas and, and 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 keeping separation between settlements. I don't think that's an issue. But what I am concerned about is having a, a, a mass of a building on the A two eight three, and so, whether or not it can be seen to be obtrusive from the South Downs. So yes, so the reason for refusal actually refers to the National Park south of the A road rather than elevated vantage points. So I see your point that at least from members point of view, the issue wasn't the extent of flat roof that's visible because you only see that from elevated viewpoint. What the reason for refusal refers to is the view of from the National Park looking out south of the A road. So in terms of the street scene, this is uh, a CGI, so it has to be taken with caution, but the elevation drawing above shows the ghosted image of the care home, which is set well back from the road. And then the treatment of the buildings right on the frontage uh, and the reintroduction of um, a building which is supposed to resemble some of the historic uh, buildings which were there in the past where the substation will be housed. So there's a treat, there will be a widened access because now it has to be for two cars, but in terms of how the development's been shaped to try and replicate what is there now, uh, we feel we've done that successfully and so is the conservation officer because obviously all of this view is within the setting and this is what view you'll get south of the a road from within that section of the national park looking north okay it wasn't in, uh, entirely what i meant but i yeah I, I do take the point on board no thank you thank you thank you councillor noel i'll come to you in a moment but we've got Councillor Crocus. Thank you, Chair. Um, several, several things I'd like to raise. Um, first of all, actually, for Councillor Dennis's benefit, um, I retired at, at 52, so would have qualified. Uh, Last year, then. After, after, yes, something like that. <laughs> Although, uh, ever since I've been a councillor, I think I've been veering back to full time employment, uh, just not getting paid for it. Um, <laughs> For Councillor Milne, um, Upper Beading Neighbourhood Plan, which I'm vaguely familiar with, did in fact have a, a expansion of an existing care home written into it as a policy. Um, so it has been done. Um, with regard to water neutrality, uh, having had my name mentioned there, uh, if I'm honest, I think it's still a bit of a mess but given the numbers that have been presented, I think I can support the argument that the development will be water neutral. However, um, I come back to the point that Councillor Noel just made really about the bulk and 
um, I don't think that the changes that have been proposed really address that. Um, so uh, I'm minded to vote against approval. Um, but uh, I'll see if there are any further arguments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just just a, a point of whether or not uh, the site could be better screened with vegetation. Um, it, there does seem to be a significant amount of vegetation around the border. Uh, can we put in some sort of uh, condition that the, that the screening sort of satisfy the bulk issue from the National Park? Um, generally speaking, landscaping shouldn't be used to make a development acceptable. It's used to soften it. Um, and mitigate it to, to, to a certain extent, but it should not be used to make it acceptable. But notwithstanding that, we do have a landscape condition. So obviously that is something we can look at um, as part of that. And, and if members felt it, it necessary, that could be in consultation with local members at that stage. Thank you. Sorry, just to add. Um, so as part of the, re the evolution of the scheme, there was a lot more landscaping put in at the request of the National Park Authority to mitigate those views. So the harm from landscaping point of view has been mitigated. The National Park uh, officer is satisfied and so is our landscape architect. And the sensitive eastern boundary, which is the, to the open fields, that has been supplemented with additional landscaping. So. Um, we feel that there's a robust landscaping scheme in there, uh, but obviously the finer detail can come through through negotiation with uh, local members if they feel they want to be involved in that um, through the discharge of the condition. Thank you. Uh, I will allow one more comment, uh, Councillor Manton. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, could the office just go back to those two views from the road, the A283 looking north? I'm just a little concerned about what I'm actually looking at there. Well, the bottom picture has a small building with three like um, arrow slit windows in it and a very large tree. Um, and the building in the background, which I take it to be the mass of the nursing home, appears to be well below um, the ridge lines. Um, and certainly, uh, what would I say, less than a quarter of the height of the tree. Although the the plan above, um, and they're both artist impressions, I know, but the plan above seems to show considerably greater mass that extends way above the roof lines of the two buildings in the foreground. Um, can somebody put some realism into those two for me, please? Yep, so I think it's just a perspective. So the CGI below is a view a line of sight where it demonstrates that what you see from the road, whereas the elevation above is the technical drawing. So the care home building will be higher than the buildings to the front because it's two storey and those are single storey. So if you're looking at a comparison between eaves and ridge to the buildings, it's the top drawing to focus on. So the picture or the artist's impression at the bottom is actually slightly misleading. Oh, it's got, it includes a perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If I can just come in, in at this point, um, obviously it's it's been a detailed discussion here and, and members really will need to consider or not whether this scheme has addressed the previous reasons for refusal. But in doing that, I just want to remind members of our five-year housing land supply position, which is significant and we have appeal decisions that say that. And members will need to consider the tilted balance in decision making. This scheme is water neutral, therefore the tilted balance does apply and you will need to consider whether any harm that arises is significantly and demonstrably outweighed by the benefits. So that is the level of harm you would have to identify to consider the scheme unacceptable. So I just want to remind members of the test within the MPPF because we were in a no five year housing land supply position. Thank you. Okay. I will now just invite um, ward councillors if they have any further comments to make. 
Claire, so, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, been very useful hearing the discussion, and I think the concern about the bulk is something else that, um, particularly looking at that picture, is is uh, is also concerning to me. Um, I do find that bottom picture misleading. Uh, the idea of some rural scene with a, a bicycle when the the roads, the cars are roaring past on the 283 and, and, and elderly people trying to cross while the cars are going at uh, high speed just doesn't really ring true. So I do um, have concerns about traffic as well. But um, thank you to uh, the, the members here for really thinking about it carefully and, and, and for drawing attention to the concerns about the bulk as well. Okay, um, thank you very much. Councillor Fisher, therefore, I would uh, propose that we move to vote on this particular item. So just to remind members, um, the recommendation is to approve subject to the conditions and details of the legal agreement as set out in the officer's report. Thank you. So. Those in favour, raise your hand, please, and keep it raised while I count. Thank you. Four. Four, yes, yes. Sorry, do not check again. Are those against, please? And those abstentions? Abstention, not my so 11 voted in favour, 7 voted against, and there was one abstention, so the motion to approve is carried. If, um, may I just make a comment before we move on? Um, I took umbrage with the comment made, not by council, but in this meeting this evening about the impartiality of the officers. That is never, never in question, uh, and I don't uh, particularly like that suggestion. So I just wanted to remind members that uh, the impartiality of office is not ever in question. Thank you. Um, what I suggest now, we take a five minute break. Uh, and uh, before the next agenda item, we will hand over to the vice chair. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so the next uh, application is DC 230185, uh, which is to, um, to look at the retention of an agricultural building and an extended hard standing. I'd like to invite the officers to uh, take us through that, that please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a few updates for the committee uh, before we start the presentation. So since the publication of the committee report, we've received six further letters of representation, uh, five additional letters of support, though they're not raising any um, new material planning considerations that we've not already mentioned in the report. Uh, one representation has received in connection with an existing objection uh, with an environmental assessment uh, attached to it. Uh, officers have reviewed this submission and I can summarise this to the committee now briefly. Um, this raises concerns regarding uh, visual impact and lighting, um, especially when it went dark uh, because of the flood lighting, uh, though this has been addressed in the report already and um, I'll go on a bit later on about the, the condition. It raises issues regarding nitrate neutrality, um, though Natural England have not declared the district subject to nutrient neutrality and therefore it's uh, not a, a matter that we need to address as part of this application. Uh, issues also relating to contamination from animal waste. Um, this is an agricultural site, uh, it's not uh, considered out of the ordinary uh, for you know, waste to be managed in a way, it obviously would be down to the applicant to make sure this is maintained. Um, although we, we can also consider attaching a condition on which we do have some wording for um, if, if councillors are minded to attach that. Um, also, concerns have been raised against noise and odour. Again, this is an, an agricultural use uh, in a rural location, so we don't consider this to be unexpected in this location. Um, and also concerns have been raised regarding ecology. Uh, the, the, the development is of a scale which would not be so significant to require mitigations or enhancements. Uh, and comments have also been made about suggesting conditions regarding limiting livestock. Uh, as this is an agricultural use, uh, this is not um, a planning use and it would not be right or proper planning to impose such a condition as it's not defined in the Town and Country Planning Act as development and therefore would not be enforceable. The Planning Commission is sought for the retention of an agricultural storage barn and associated hard standing. The application relates to an agricultural small holding sited on the northwestern side of Stallhouse Lane. The site is mostly laid to grass with an internal wire fencing field boundaries, in addition to hard standing and the application barn. The storage barn itself is sited parallel to the southeastern boundary of the site facing Stallhouse Lane. The application also seeks to retain the area of hard standing, which extends towards the centre of the site. The barn measures approximately 14.7 metres in length and 5 metres in depth with a monopitched roof with an eaves height of between 2.5 and 2.8 metres in height. The barn comprises four bays, three of which are open and is used for storage of feed and materials and in addition to uh, livestock sheltering during the lambing season. Uh, the barn is composed of timber cladding with a sheeted metal roof. As I've previously mentioned, uh, we do advise the following amendment to condition three attached to the committee report, uh, which effectively is seeking to require details of the lighting to be submitted and approved in writing by the local planning authority within three months of the date of the decision notice. Um, this effectively just gives us greater control over the, uh, the lighting of the proposal. Uh, our enforcement team is satisfied that this condition will be enforceable and that a breach of condition can be served if the details are not submitted within the, uh, the monitoring period. Uh, these slides here, sorry, this slide here illustrates the barn itself when viewed from inside the site, um, in addition to uh, the access point on Storehouse Lane and also Storehouse Lane itself here. Um, note that this, take, this photo was taken in March, uh, so obviously um, boundary planting isn't in full leaf there, so it would look a bit different at this time of year. <clears throat> uh, this slide illustrates the appearance of the barn and the site when viewed from the neighbouring property woodside, uh, which is approximately uh, 90 metres or so to the um, to the south uh, from where I was standing when I took this photograph and the other uh, photo on the slide here illustrates the mess facilities uh, which is associated with the land which is not subject to this planning application. Uh, this slide just gives an illustration um, of an aerial view of the site and its wider surroundings, uh, the site being shown in orange just up to the top there uh, with a red circle showing similar examples of buildings uh, close by to the to the highway 
um, some larger, some smaller. Um, so it's just to give an indication there. And finally, the slide here just shows the barn when viewed from the street looking towards the southwest as you travel out of Storehouse Lane. You can just about make the um, make out the building uh, from this angle. Um, and again, it's important to note that the, the planting here was not in full leaf uh, as the photo was taken in March. Uh, given the setting and the similar examples on the street, officers do not consider that the barn has any overbearing appearance on the street or creates any sense of enclosure. Officers therefore recommend to the committee that the application is approved subject to conditions, including the revised uh, condition three as previously advised. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'd now like to invite um, Tatiana Milne Skillman uh, to speak. And Tatiana is speaking on behalf of three residents, so she has six minutes. Thank you. Good evening, members. I'm speaking on behalf of eight households who object to this application. We are frankly shocked and disappointed to find this application recommended for approval. While the application may present a small scale rural, the impacts are anything but. Some of us live immediately next and opposite to the side. Our properties were purchased to live in a quiet and tranquil rural setting. Despite what is alleged in the application, there are lots of animal and therefore lots of noise and lots of smell. This small holding sits within and amongst lots of homes along that part of Storehouse Lane, which is actually very residential. The application has not been accompanied by a noise assessment or an environmental health report. Consequently, we have had to commission an environmental report, which raises the following. Possible contamination of the water course. The site lies within a nitrate vulnerable zone. As the report states, the use of the site as a small holding will increase nitrate pollution, causing a risk to health and wildlife. Evidence of an increase in flies and vermin, flies and rats, causing real threat to human health. No ecology report has been requested, despite a member of the public writing in that she regularly sees newts towards the end of the field along the footpath she frequents. A young family next door who had thought they had bought their dream home at Woodside before the peacocks created their small holding are being kept awake by the constant noise, smell and other activities that take place on the land. The anxiety this is causing is taking a real toll on their mental health and their quality of life and the enjoyment of their property. We would draw members attention to the fact that permitted development regulations seek a 400 meter separation distance between animals such as sheep, goats and pigs and nearby residential properties. Whilst we acknowledge this is a full planning application, clearly the guidance set out in the PD regulations is effectively best practice. So why would officers want to recommend permission that clearly falls short of these standards and potentially risk the health of very close neighbours? Again, we refer to the environmental report. The noise and smell and general disturbance is impacting on our residential amenity and is detrimental to the character of the area. As far as low impact regarding the proximity of a listed building, we did some research as to what criteria the officers might apply in previous applications. Regulations state that when an application is made within the residential curtilage of a listed building, it becomes a matter of concern. The distance between the barn and Laurel Cottage is 24 meters, which is very close indeed, and arguably akin to a residential curtilage. Also, the barn was built within 25 meters of the road, a distance which contravenes the permitted development regulations. So if the listed building sits 24 meters from the barn and the barn breaks the rules on 25 meter PD regs rules, how can anyone argue that this is of no concern and low impact? This distance is also much closer than two previous applications regarding that of a garage at Frith Cottage and a very modern extension at one storehouse. Neither of these applications were even facing that part of Laura Cottage that is in fact listed. But these applications were very much of concern. However, Peacock's paddocks is of no concern according to the officers. We are also concerned that there will be pressure to try and get residential accommodation on the land. 
While we acknowledge members must determine applications before them, we remain concerned that in recommending this application, there are insufficient conditions proposed in the event it is granted. There are numerous inaccuracies in the planning statement, which is the information the applicants put forward themselves. The size of the plot of land as being four acres, but in fact 2.4 acres, a 40% overstatement according to the land register, the selling of meat and slaughtering of animals. When questioned by the officers, then unsurprisingly denied by the applicant as this would be unlawful without the proper licenses, but evidenced on social media by way of a price list. The fact that there has been a caravan for 14 continuous years is untrue, as many of us can attest to. Some of us have lived there for 26 years. Then other issues, such as the enormous amount of lights, the formalization of a front entrance with ornate gate, window boxes, gate lights, etc., regular events evidenced by social media. And interestingly, the last letters of support posted in the last three days online on the council's portal, stating that the applicant will be applying for a further enlargement of the barn when successful on this application. And then there is again the mention of slaughtering and selling in meat from the presence premises in this particular letter. There's clearly more to this application than meets the eye. We would categorically ask members to refuse this application because of environmental and ecological concerns on health and safety grounds as set out in the environmental impact assessment report, the listed building being considerably impacted by the barn, increased traffic and loss of amenity. But if you are minded to grant it, then please can you add conditions to ensure that the caravan remains a mess room only and at no time can be lived in residentially, that a suite of environmental health conditions are added to deal with animal numbers, waste, smell, hours of operations, conditions are applied to control the comings and goings of vehicles, and that the use granted is specific and not open-ended. Finally, we would ask that all remaining PD rights are removed, particularly those that would allow a Class Q conversion. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Would you like to respond or, or should we go on to um, Gemma, Gemma Peacock? Okay. Gemma Peacock. Good evening, councillors. Um, I just do need to add before I read what I've got down here. Woodside actually purchased a year after we actually established ourselves on the land as a small holding. So we were already there. Um, so I've had to write this down because I'm a little bit nervous. Um, as you know, we are standing in front of you today in relation to our current planning application for our much needed agricultural barn. Throughout the past couple of months, we have been watching objections appear on the portal and we have been in total disbelief with the lies and fabrications. The reason I asked to speak today is to give you an insight into me and my family and our dreams and aspirations for Peacock's Paddock. I, Gemma Peacock, my husband Tony, and our two girls, Casey and Willow. To look at me, you probably wouldn't think I'm fighting a very rare cancer. It's terminal. Sadly, I am. I was given two to three years to live in 2013. The past 10 years have brought us the toughest of challenges. I should not be alive today. Tony has a fantastic reputation for its construction skills. He has a huge portfolio of clients nationwide including two local parish councils and the homeowners of Stallhouse Lane and Gay Street. When we purchased the plot, it was a terrible mess. There was a huge amount of rubbish, piles of hardcore and other scrap items, which were mostly hidden by overgrown vegetation. As soon as we could, we set to work clearing rubbish, topping, cutting hedgerows, refencing, rolling, harrowing and cutting the grass to get it back to a functioning pasture and much, much more. We have also installed bird boxes, hedgehog houses and planted a fruit orchard and more native trees in an effort to boost our wildlife, which we're very passionate about. On site, we currently have rare breed sows, only two, by the way, Jacob rams, ewes and lambs. We then co-own approximately 50 ewes, which are located a few miles down the road, which will never be kept on the ground because there's not enough land there. And a breeding boar, which we also co-own. This was our second year lambing in the barn. We convert the two middle bays into multiple lambing pens, 
so that our ewes can come in to give birth. This eliminates many risks that can result in losses with outdoor, outdoor lambing. This year we set up cameras in the barn so that we could watch ewes and lambs remotely, eliminating our need to keep driving to and from home so often, and so we don't add extra traffic to the lane. We visit once a day, seven days a week without fail, to feed and water. However, it's not unusual for us to pop up twice a day, which we feel is responsible, and occasionally we spend all day Saturday and Sunday enjoying what is now our haven. It is my piece of therapy. Gemma, but, can I ask and I remind you it's two minutes, so you have had that, so if you could sum up, that would be great. That, sorry, I got a bit passionate in there, I do apologise. For all of us, time at the small holding is quality and precious. As avid animal and, wild, and wildlife lovers, being at small holding is therapy. Without the barn, we would not be able to continue farming the land, and this would ultimately lead us to having to get rid of our animals, and this would be devastating to us as a family and a shame for an agricultural area. Thank you very Thank much. You. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to go back on to a few comments from the objector, um, obviously regarding the animals' um, noise and odours, as previously discussed, um, this is an agricultural small holding in a resident, in a, sorry, in a rural area. You know, this this level of activity from such a use would not be unexpected in this location. Um, regardless of whether or not the barn was there, you know, the animals could still be on site creating noise and odours. Um, so there's one, there's that point. Um, so obviously we, we didn't want of the view that a noise assessment was needed. Uh, regards to contamination, obviously I've, I've already covered the fact that we could um, attach another condition regarding the storage of animal uh, waste. Um, and we can attach that so we can have approval of that detail prior, um, well, within three months. yeah, within three months of, of the date of the permission. Um, regards to the, the mess hall and caravan itself, um, you know, as previously noted and, and as part of the report and in the officer's report, um, you know, we've already considered this, this doesn't fall under the, the category of development, um, as part of the enforcement, um, case on the site and therefore it doesn't form part of this application. So we wouldn't be able to attach any conditions to this application. Um, for that use, and in any case, as we've already said, it's not development, so we uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to attach anything there. Um, with regards to the access, uh, Storehouse Lane is not a classified road, therefore any new access to the site would not require planning permission itself. Um, points raised about permitted development and the impact on the listed building, um, you know, we've assessed that that impact would be acceptable, um, and I'd like to refer to the consul, uh, sorry, the consultation response from the conservation officer. Um, with regards to the sales of meat, um, we are aware of this um, and it's something also that our environmental health team are currently investigating as well. Um, again, we don't consider this as an unusual use in a rural location uh, in connection with an agricultural small holding. Uh, we're satisfied that it would be ancillary to the agricultural use. Um, you know, however, if we are aware that if this issue was to inten intensify, you know, such as importing more meat and materials and packaging, etc. on site, then we would obviously take a different view then, but um, that doesn't appear to be the case with this application at the moment. Uh, regards to lighting as well, as previously addressed as well, we'd like to attach a, a revised condition um, as per the wording up on the screen now. Um, comments regarding newts as well. Um, we have been, been in discussion with our, our new licensing um, consultee. Uh, they're of the view that the development would not have been of a scale that they, they would have been concerned about this. Um, and they have suggested uh, that we can attach an informative um, as well regarding um, news, which which I do have the wording of, but I don't have it on screen, but we can also um, attach that to the condition if needs be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd now like to ask the local uh, councillors whether they have anything to say. I believe Paul Clark, you're one of the local councillors. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Um, this is a difficult. Thank you, pardon. Sorry, I'm just, sorry. just a point for the Chairman. I'm terribly sorry, but I've just realised when Gemma Peacock came up to speak that I actually know the applicants, and right. therefore I have to uh, declare an interest. I didn't put two and two together earlier on. They're not close close acquaintances, but I do know them, so I'd like to withdraw from voting, please. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Clark. Thank you. This is not an easy one because we have to look at it in planning terms, um, according to planning criteria, um, but also coming into it is everything that you see around the planning criteria and planning issues. I've um, got several questions. Um, one of them, thankfully, is a statement that at least there's no water neutrality issues here, so we can forget about that one, thank God. But um, I'm a bit surprised about not taking the caravan into account because using the caravan on site to tend the animals, I understand, but not mentioning it at all, I do find somewhat surprising. Or does this fall under the 28 day rule? In which case, maybe you can tell me that. Um, so yeah, so we have had a, an enforcement um, investigation on the site and that was for the uh, it was an allegation for the stationing of a mobile home for permanent residences. Um, part of the conclusion of that um, that investigation was that the because the caravan was used for agricultural purposes as a mess facility, it falls well. It wouldn't fall under being categorised as development under the Town and Country Planning Act. So it's section fifty five of the Town and Country Planning Act, um, subsection two point e, which I can quote. Um, says it basically excludes the use of any land for the purpose of agriculture or forestry, including afforestation, and for the use of any of those purposes of any building occupied together with uh, the land so used. So our enforcement team were of the view that it doesn't constitute development. But just to add to that, obviously, if those circumstances change and our enforcement team have been out to the site and been in, you've seen inside the caravan, then that would be subject to a separate enforcement investigation in terms of how it's used. But just to be mindful, members, that's not before us today. Whatever your views are on the caravan, we are just considering the barn. And so we do need to focus our discussions on the barn. Thank you. Thank you. I realise that, but I was surprised it wasn't included. Um, I am particularly concerned because in the use of the barn, you know, you'd expect it to machinery, you'd expect it hay, you'd expect oats and stuff like that, but I am a bit concerned. When I raised the point with the planning officer about the storage of meat and storage of meat products, I was told it was ancillary of, 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 the, of, the, um, of the barn. Um, and I was told that it wasn't really that regulatory condition number two is about as tight as it can get, but it doesn't actually mention that sort of point. And I was a bit concerned about that particular condition. So I understand it for farm equipment, animal feed, storage and hay, and possibly temporary housing of animals, especially during the lambing season, which I perfectly understand. I hear the lambs from my house enough times in the winter. But um, I just wondered if you could clarify that. Certainly, Councillor Clark. Um, I think it's the sales on the site will be a matter of fact and degree as to whether it needs planning permission or not. You know, you, you would have the use of the site. No, sorry, you can't. No, you can't. You're not allowed to interject in the planning debate. Please. Please, sir, can I remind you that this is not a public meeting? Sir, please. Thank you. Councillor Clark, it is a matter of fact and degree as to whether the sale of meat from the site would require planning permission. Um, it, with any site, you can have a smaller element, kind of another use, which would be ancillary and wouldn't require planning permission. So if there was a small element happening, it's likely that it wouldn't require planning permission. If something became more wholesale and therefore would become more of a retail use, that would fall outside of the scope of this application and we'd have to investigate that. So it is a matter of fact and degree, but it's likely some element would be ancillary to its use as a, as a, as a holding. I hope that helps. Okay. I was only concerned because we have had cases like that on the, on the, um, the Coolum to Thacombe Road where there was a, a case that's a bit similar to this. Um, the issue of animal noises, I mean, it's in the countryside um, and, you know, one lives with countryside noises. I mean, the only problem is pigs, of course. Can officers all clarify the difference between the um, full planning permission and the one where you were outlined planning permission? I didn't quite catch that point where the, the, the rules change. 
I think what some of the objectives were relating to was permitted development and as the members will be familiar with permitted development essentially a tick box exercise if it meets certain criteria you don't need planning permission so you know it, you can build agricultural buildings under permitted development if it meets certain criteria that doesn't mean that something can't come forward for a full planning permission even if it doesn't meet those criteria then you would assess it as we are today with the application before us and all those considerations. Thank you. And what about taking a barn in the countryside, as we have had a number of examples, especially in Pulbra, and then, and then applying for um, unconditioned queue, I think it's called, to convert it into a dwelling? Tomorrow probably is more familiar with that than I am, but I understand it has to be in place. Can... Uh, to benefit from class Q by approval to convert an agricultural barn to a dwelling, it would need to have been in place uh, on the relevant date being the 20th of March 2013. So uh, this barn was was not in place at that point, so it wouldn't benefit from class Q permitted development rights. Thank you. Um, final point then. Um, I note that the lighting condition has been tightened up and that that's been reworded, which is a good thing. Um, it was also mentioned that we could put a condition to do with the treatment of animal waste or effluent treatment from animals. How would officers do that? Uh, so I've scribbled down some suggested wording um, and I'll be happy to share that with you before we issue the decision if we are minded to approve today. Um, so something along the lines of within three months of the date of this permission, details of the location, size and storage of animal waste shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. The approved details shall thereafter be retained as such unless otherwise agreed to and approved in writing by the local planning authority and for the reason being in the interest of uh, amenity in accordance with policy 33 of the HDPF 2015. Thank you. So presumably that will be well clear when you water courses because Despite the fact that water, the report doesn't mention water courses, there are water courses in the area, basically. Well, obviously, part of the discharge services that we would we would then be able to take those those material matters into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, Councillor Campbell, would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, well, uh, Councillor Clark's covered a lot of the things I'd scribbled down. Um, but the, the one point I wanted to pick up on uh, was mention of nitrate potential nitrate pollution. Um, I think Paul's, sorry, Councillor Clark's covered the, um, the idea that, that there might be some study into animal waste. Could the effect of nitrates be included? Um, much of the country is designated an area where it needs to demonstrate nutrient neutrality. Um, that it's not that it hasn't been designated in Horsham District, um, and and whilst we recognise it is a concern, ultimately that the. the the planning view is it, it is acceptable in that respect. Um, obviously, we need to consider water neutrality, but not nutrient neutrality in Horsham District. Thank you. Right. Um, yes, I'd like to invite the other any other members who'd like to speak. Councillor Trollope. Uh, yes. Can we take uh, assurance that the condition for lighting would be such that to any reasonable neighbour it would not be a nuisance? I don't understand what those words mean, to be honest. Um, so what effectively what we're asking as part of this condition is, is more detailed details of the lighting. So um, the IALP, which is the Institute of Lighting Professionals Guidance, um, uh, they effectively set out um, brightness and luminance of, of lights. And they also suggest things like particular shrouding, so things to cover lights from spilling out into into open areas and as part of this we would be in consultation with our environmental health department who deal with this on a daily basis so I, I'm, I'm confident that we would be able to get that detail from the applicant or their agent and then you know go through consultation with our environmental health team to make sure that that is acceptable so in summary to a reasonable neighbour, that would not be a nuisance. I think we, we would obviously consider the impact on amenity, whether that would satisfy the objections or not. Obviously, we can't say, but we would certainly take into account the impact on their properties as part of the consideration of that lighting scheme. Sorry, I just want to add there, um, the, technically, nuisance is a private law matter, so it can't be a material consideration because it would 
involve a subjective decision by the planning officers as to whether any lighting amounted to a private nuisance. So it's not generally a planning matter, the nuisance itself, the lighting is the planning matter. So that's what the condition controls. I know that's quite an annoying lawyer-like answer, <laughs> but unfortunately, I just want to make sure um, of the integrity of the consideration and, and obviously the applicants would have complaint if um, this committee broadened its consideration out to include a concept of nuisance that isn't actually a planning consideration. Okay, so in other words, it is, we can take assurance that it's being held to a certain standard, a professional standard. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trollope. Are there any other members who'd like to speak? Uh, Councillor Circus? Um, I just wanted to ask, this, this is a form of words that we've come across before. It's the first uh, sentence of 3.4. Um, and um, I remember our head of development telling us that this was wording that uh, um, no one at uh, HDC had, had written um, because they would write better English than this. And that this had come from higher authority. And um, just to make sure, I think I know what it means, but uh, I wonder whether the head of development could translate this into English so we can be absolutely certain we understand what it means. <laughs> Certainly, Councillor Circus. So, so this, this relates to the comments from the conservation officer um, and the term less than substantial harm may seem strange language but it's actually what's written into the national planning policy framework and is, is essentially the test of the level of harm on on a listed building or its setting um so, so that that's where it comes from um, and when something's less than substantial harm it means it's there's a small very small level of harm essentially um and, and so that that's what's been identified by the conservation officer in their comments thank you Sorry, and can I just add to that as well? Um, so that, yeah, it's paragraph 202 of the MPPF, um, and it requires the local planning authority to then weigh the, the, that harm against the benefits of the scheme, which we've done further on in the, in the report at 6.19 6 to 6.24. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Circus. Are there any other? Uh, Councillor Milne. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I read a 6.1 that originally that um, this it wasn't the barn that was uh, complained about it was the it was the caravan and, and it was only on that inspect, inspection that the issue of the barn was raised so does that mean that the barn was built and didn't get any objection um, until until the inspection of the caravan um, yes I think that that was brought up as part of the investigation but obviously that's not particularly relevant to the application because they've submitted for the for the proposal before us today no I, I understand i understand we're not considering the caravan but it's just that, that so the barn existed or was built without initially without uh, objection um it was only when it was discovered as it were accidentally when we, the caravan was inspected that it was raised as an issue I, I think that's the case but i think we'd be mindful about perhaps making that assumption because ultimately the fact is it, it required consent that's been submitted and we have objections um, on this application which we need to consider so I, I, you're, I think you're right but I think it doesn't really add any weight to our decision making today thank you thank you thank you very much Councillor Milne uh, Councillor Manton yes uh, thank you uh, Madam Chairman um, I took the opportunity this afternoon because, as Liz will know, I turned up for this meeting at 2.30, quite by mistake, so I had time to kill. Um, so I drove down to, uh, to, this, <laughs> to this spot um, to look at the, uh, the, the point there. It seems to me that as you proceed up um, uh, the lane, there are a number of small holdings on the left-hand side with some residential houses on the right-hand side. Um, this particular plot, the mass and uh, size of the barn was, in my personal view, not excessive. It was quite well hidden behind the trees. Um, 
looking across the small holding, um, the main uh, Pulvera to Billingshurst railway line runs across the back edge of the, uh, of, of the plot. Um, there were about six sheep in the field. Um, the train made more noise than the sheep did um, going through, and there was not any particular odour or smell. Um, however, having said all that, I would like to be assured that um, it will be used strictly for agricultural purposes um, and the raising of sheep. Um, I don't know quite what the rules are on the slaughter of animals. I understood they had to go to a slaughterhouse, um, so that would concern me if there was if there was evidence of there being slaughtering taking place there. Um, but again, I would like that, if possible, to be uh, covered in any conditions. But having said that, the uh, um, the barn, to my view, seems entirely suitable for a small holding raising um, sheep. Thank you very much, Councillor Manton. Did you want to respond? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Manton. Um, thank you for your comments. Just in terms of the slaughter of meat, I, th I think that's not being applied for here, and I think we need to be mindful of that. We can't add conditions on relating to something that's that's not applied for. I think that the you know if the processing of meat needs different requirements by different legislation outside of planning and we should not replicate the requirements of other legislation in planning and as my colleague said our environmental health colleagues are already discussing this and I think it will be for them to 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 take that forward and it and it shouldn't be something we would consider here thank you thank you very much are there any other points to be raised anybody else want to speak I just I was I'm curious as to why this why, why this is here today this application it, it's already been built as a permitted building mm -hmm. why um, so just to clarify whilst it's been built it doesn't have permission so it was built without planning permission and the planning system allows retrospective planning permission to be sought so that's what's before you today um, it's brought to committee at my discretion but that's generally relating to the number of, of representations that we've received. Thank you. Thank you. I just on 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 the other application, which is retrospective, it actually says that in the title, sort of. But I couldn't find anywhere that's actually said that this was a retrospective um, application. That's all. It, it does say the retention of an agricultural building as part of the description. The difficulty in planning terms is we have to take the description as on the application form and we can only amend descriptions with the consent of the applicant. So generally speaking, we would always go with the, the description as has been submitted by the applicant. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Um, are there any further councillors that would like to speak on this? No. I'd just like to uh, take a moment, if I may. Um, so I think, councillors, there's been some suggestion about additional condition. So if, if members wanted the proposal with a, an additional condition, that would need to be put forward as an alternative motion with so as per printed with an additional condition. Thank you. So are there any members who'd like to put forward that motion? Thank you, Councillor <coughs> Clark. Yes, I'd like to put forward that the extra condition be added on is, is the one about treatment of the animal waste, which the officer outlined briefly earlier on, and the other conditions have been amended satisfactorily as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Is that seconded? Right, we'll go to the vote then. So the motion uh, before us is to approve the application subject to the following conditions, uh, which you know, the uh, conditions regarding the, the lighting, the storage of uh, the use of the barn, and also the um, additional one regarding the storage of the, the siting of the storage of the manure. So, 
All those in favour? Yes. Of order. It does, yes. Right. The storage of the, man of the manure. Okay. Right. You said it now. Yes. So, all those in favour? Could you put up your hands and hold it there? And those against? That's one against. <coughs> Any abstentions? Would you? Would you abstain? Yes. So that's sixteen and in flavour. One, one against, and one abstention. So the motion is carried. Thank you very much. So we shall consecrate. No, just So uh, we'll be joined by the chairman in a second. If you could all uh, stay with us, thank you. Microphone. Thank you. Um, now move to item number seven. No, apologies. Apologies. That's correct. Item number eight. DC 230339. Erection of a detached carport and log store and creation of new access to the highway in part retrospective. I'll ask the officers to present. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is an application that seeks full planning permission for the erection of a detached carport and log store, along with the creation of a new access. The frontage of the site has been cleared and de development has begun uh, through excavation and engineering operations to provide the level access, the laying of hard standing and the construction of reinforced cement retaining walls. So this application is part retrospective. The application follows an earlier planning permission approved under reference DC 20 1972, which related to the erection of a detached double garage and bin and log store. Uh, this development was sited further to the west of the current location, away from the Grade 2 listed building. The applicant has outlined that the approval as granted could not have been implemented due to the stability of the steeply sloping ground to the west of the site and the potential resulting impact on the neighbouring property. The current application seeks an alternative position to address these issues. And as a correction to the committee report, members are advised that Paulborough Parish Council did object to the, to the development on the, de in the, on the grounds of design, over development within the conservation area and out of keeping with the character of the area, proximity to the Grade 2 listed building and damage to a wall, loss of general amenity and impact on trees and landscaping. 
Uh, the application site is located to the north of the street, outside of any built-up area boundary. The site is therefore located within the countryside in policy terms. The site relates to a two-storey dwelling which benefits from garden space extending to the north, east and west, with the dwelling positioned at 90 degrees to the public highway. The wider surroundings are characterised by detached residential properties of varying sizes within various sized plots, and there are examples of detached outbuildings within the locality. The application site comprises a Grade 2 listed building located within the Nutbourne Conservation Area, as indicated by the blue dashed line. A number of Grade 2 listed buildings are located in proximity to the site, as indicated by the yellow stars. As shown by the block plan, the development is located to the west of the Grade 2 listed building and comprises a carport with parking area and log store. Due to surrounding ground levels, the carport is set within the slope with reinforced concrete retaining walls to the north and west. These would be finished in brickwork with the driveway finished in stoned paving. The garden area between the dwelling and the carport would be regraded with additional planting and landscaping proposed. As shown by the elevations, the carport would be sited on lower ground level than the Grade 2 listed building, with the land immediately adjacent to the heritage asset regraded. The sloped ground level would be retained to the north and west of the application building. The proposal would be reflective of the scale of outbuildings found in the surrounding area, and the impact on the designated conservation area would be neutral. It is considered that the scale and siting of the carport would not prevent an appreciation or understanding of the principal list of building, although it is recognised that the close proximity of the building would result in some impact to its setting. It is, however, considered that the relationship would result in less than substantial harm to the setting of the listed building, and this harm would be at the lower end of the scale. The site photos show the development and its relationship with the Grade 2 listed building. The reinforced concrete Sorry, yeah, reinforced concrete wall to the east, um, as shown in this site, uh, site photo here and here, uh, would be removed as part of the approved development with the garden area regraded. This would provide open views to the listed building and, would, and is considered to reduce the massing of the development overall. Uh, so this is a, a visual representation of the development for reference. It is recognised that the impact of the proposed carport on the setting of the listed building is greater than the development originally approved. However, the proposed design comprises a more open structure, with this approach retaining some views towards the listed building. This is considered to be an improvement over the previous planning permission. In addition, the proposed siting has avoided potential consequences on the stability of the slope to the west. The proposal is therefore considered to represent an improved form and design with some public benefit arising. The degree of harm arise, resulting from the scheme being less than substantial and that the lower end of the scale is therefore considered to be outweighed by the public, uh, public benefit identified. The design of the carport is considered appropriate to the locality and would preserve the character and appearance of the wider conservation area. It is considered that the siting and layout of the development would be sufficient to prevent any unacceptable harm to neighbouring amenity with no highway safety issues or highway impact anticipated. It is also concluded that the development would not result in a significant impact on the designated Aran Valley sites through water issues. The proposal is therefore recommended for approval uh, subject to the conditions within section 7 of the committee report. Thank you. Okay, we have um, two public speakers, and I would uh, invite Frank Riddle to speak first. I understand you're hard of hearing. Is it, can you hear me okay? I hope you can hear me. Yep. Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, on behalf of the Nutbourne Conservation and History Group and the Nutbourne Residents Association, and in support of the 17 or so local residents and including the Pulper Parish Council who have formally objected to this retrospective application, I'd like to reiterate the common objections. Number one, it is much too large and dominates over the cottage. It is much too close to the listed Ebsworth cottage. It destroys nearly all of the traditional front garden. 
it has already destroyed a big section of listed wall listed in the West Sussex County Council uh, conservation area policy. Um, the facing parts of the garage are proposed to be brick, and this should be the stone removed from the listed wall. You can see the brick in this building, building here. The last objection is that it doesn't comply with our VDS or the West Sussex County Council conservation area policies. Nevertheless, having regard for the unapproved foundation work already done on the cost of doing it, etc., we have consulted with a chartered building surveyor and propose a revised application could be considered by converting the current unapproved foundations to provide a large four meter wide single garage stroke carport. This is adequate and gives space within for logs and bins. The original approval gave a space of nine meters between the cottage and the carport. And contrary to what you said about the, the you couldn't put it nearer the boundary because it would fall in. I've known Nutbourne for some 50 or 60 years, uh, lived there the last 26 and done extensive work in, in the locality. Uh, in my own garden, you can dig down and form a sheer cliff without any fear of, of a landslide downward. Um, anyway, the, the original carport gave a space of nine meters and the suggested modification would achieve this, would not achieve this, but it would achieve 6.5 meters, significantly improving the space and much better than the 4.5 meters in the unapproved position applied for. A further benefit of a smaller garage is that the roof becomes lower, smaller and far less dominant. Um, and in support of um, um, the very special cottage, I hope that this approval can be rejected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, call upon uh, Councillor John Wallace, former parish council, to speak. And if you could stick to your allotted five minutes, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and members of Orsham District Council. Um, we on uh, Pulborough Parish Council, and indeed in uh, the Nutbourne Residents Association, um, can't understand Horsham's approach to conservation. Little has been demonstrated um, with this alleged development site. Um, you, you start with a grade two listed beautiful cottage, albeit in need of, in need of repair. Um, and yet um, it's now had the thatch removed and some very cheap, nasty tiling. In fact, two lots of nasty tiling because they don't all match um, put on the structure. If you look at that, you can clearly see there are more than, more than one. Um, I, I visited the site today uh, they talk about the concrete uh, retaining wall. It's more like a concrete bunker um, with, with uh, walls on three sides, um, actually collecting water, which is interesting. Um, the, um, the log store is, is a complete nonsense. It's, 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 it's fiction. They've taken the, the chimney down. They don't intend to burn logs. They've now replaced the chimney at request of Horsham planning. Uh, but it's capped. I mean, it, this is blatant um, 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 on truth. It's really bad show. Um, I will repeat, uh, I'm not trying to get too boring, um, a lot of what Frank has just said. Um, the proposed structure is far too big. It's, it's unnecessarily high. It's already too high over the vehicles, as you can see. And the roof line is, is, is just crazy. Obviously, they want to put a, an annex or something up there, for which, of course, they'll um, put in retrospective planning um, application <coughs> later on. Um, and, and everything they've done on this site has been a disaster, total disaster. Um, it's far too close to the cottage. It totally dominates the site. 
Um, if you actually go on Google Earth, you can see that they had previously been driving in and around the cottage to the east of the site. And if that was sited behind the cottage, um, it would, they would be able to restore a lot of the width of the, the wall, which as Frank has said, has been cut down and just put in gates and then you can have a driveway in and around and you wouldn't have that dominating the site. Um, but I don't think they care about stuff like that. Um, the, um, the walls as they have built it, uh, they just look like a concrete bunker. It's just, just awful. There have been some 18 letters of, of, the, letters of objection, not only from residents of Nutbourne, but also from nearby residents who are totally horrified with what has gone on here. I mean, remember that this is in a conservation area. Um, I, I don't understand um, the approach uh, demonstrated. Uh, I mean, all this work contravenes the Nutbourne Village Design Statement, as Frank has said, and the uh, design guidance as requested by HTC. It contravenes the scale and balance laid down for structures within the conservation area. Um, it's it's um, it's just, it's, I think in all the years, and I've been a parish councillor now for some 16 and involved with planning throughout, this is, I think, the worst site I've had to deal with. Since obviously I understand that HDC planning are minded to permit this further desecration, I urge you, please, to object to this um, yet another retrospective application. Um, the harm already inflicted upon not born has been substantial. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, I'll... No, okay, nothing to respond there from the, the officers. I'll call upon the local ward or local members and uh, firstly, Councillor Campbell. Well, <coughs> my first reaction to it is that it does seem completely incongruous um, and you know just looking at the scale of it as, as, as uh, Councillor Wallace said it does seem out of keeping and un unnecessary um, so that would be my initial comment but I sort of re re I'll retain an open mind whilst we get comments from other people. Thank you Councillor Campbell. Uh, Councillor Clark would you like to add anything? Thank you, Chairman. Officers made an interesting comment, which perhaps they can clarify a bit. What public benefit were you referring to? Uh, the public benefit arises from um, the indication that there would be an impact on the stability of the slope to the west and a potential impact on the neighbouring property um, in terms of reference to that. Uh, that is something that the conservation officer raised within their comments. Um, so that is within 3.5 of the committee report and then uh, going to the planning assessment in terms of that balance uh, I think it's between sort of 6.8 and 6.10. Thank you. Um, I know the site reasonably well. I've been leafleting in the area many times and I've been walked around there on the way to the pub a number of times. Um, for me um, it appears that certainly what's being proposed here in the state that it is effectively destroys the public amenity of the lane um, and basically is also quite it is subjective as to the impact on the grade two listed building but oh sorry you had a good photograph there if you this one? yeah it's around the corner though but it but the lane is, is a traditional old lane with a, a lovely flint wall and everything. So for me, what's being proposed um, in this case to correct the error or whatever it is, destroys the public amenity of the lane um, and is quite incongruous in the context of the Grade 2 listed building, which has already been unfortunately tampered with quite considerably um, from photographs that you can see in the past. But we're not looking at that, we're looking at the garage, I realise that. For me, the scheme as it is proposed is over development of the site um, is too big, it's too close to the original, it's too close to the building, um, there's not that much space between it. If it was a smaller garage, 
like a single bay garage, that would be more acceptable because the mass massing effect would be smaller. Because as you come around the corner of the lane, if you have that, it's, it's bad enough with the concrete bunker that's there, but if you have that garage there, it totally destroys the amenity and the setting of that listed building, which to be honest is, a, is now a very nice building. Um, so for me, it's got a massive impact and it's for me over development of the site. Um, I also regret the vandalism of, and I call it vandalism because for me it is vandalism of an old flint wall like that and basically just drop, punching a hole through the wall. So if it went ahead and was approved, which you know, we'll see what the arguments are, certainly brick walls in that setting, I think, are not, necess are not the best option and that a more traditional old fashioned look would be more appropriate and more in setting with the, the listed building. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, just to point out, uh, notwithstanding the, the detail shown here, there is a condition relating to uh, materials. So there is some potential there to look at different materials as part of that condition if members were minded to approve it. Um, and also just to remind members that there was obviously a previous consent um, for a double garage on the site. Obviously, officers acknowledge it was further from the list of building and, and, and slightly, uh, um, the, the, the proposal is slightly taller, but, but there was a double garage nonetheless permitted. Thank you. I don't think um, I have much more to add. I think you covered it very well. Councillor Clark, um, I'd agree with the, your comments you've made, um, especially about the closer to the closer to the property and uh, didn't seek permission to move it closer. And it currently does look like a, a concrete bunker. Um, I'll come to you in a moment, but thank you very much. Uh, just I will open to debate. I don't know who had their hands open first, but I'll go with Councillor Dennis. Thank you. Um, yes, and I, I've, I've also um, know this cottage, uh, having been to the same pub probably on the uh, as well. <laughs> I know the walk very well uh, because it goes straight to the vineyard too. Um, and I have seen it as a beautiful slightly dilapidated thatched cottage with the prettiest of cottage gardens on, on a, in a conservation area, absolutely right in its own setting, to seeing um, the place modernised, I can only say, on the cheap, and that's evident by those tiles that are currently sitting there, which are machine cut and not hand. In fact, why it wasn't conditional to go back to thatch, I do not know. Um, it, it, it is, we must encourage our custodians of our listed buildings to treat them with the respect that they are actually due. And um, respect not only the building, but also the setting in which they're contained. Um, by over-modernising that particular setting, they have ruined what I think of as what was a delightful walk in terms of settings within a conservation area. Um, uh, and I think personally, retrospective planning would, would actually just set a precedent for other people to come in and do the same. Just to, to clarify, um, obviously, recognise we've got an application here that's part retrospective. Um, obviously, that the fact that it's part retrospective doesn't carry weight in decision making. So we just need to assess it the same as though it wasn't there um, when we're considering it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Manton. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yes, I can only reiterate what my uh, friends are saying here. Um, looking at that myself, um, well, the red brick around the wood store and the red brick uh, on the, I believe, western boundary um, is totally incongruous with the uh, lower floor of the cottage in the background, which I'm not sure from the pictures I can see here whether that's flint faced or stone faced um, but certainly modern red brick um, causes great harm to me in, in that uh, uh, setting looking at the uh, carport uh, I mean I notice a Range Rover in there having owned one they're about six feet high um, and there seems to be another 
three foot above that, um, making that those two bays incredibly high bays for some reason. I, and then a roof on the top that I believe Prince Charles once mentioned, King Charles he is now, my apologies to him, sir, um, as a monstrous carbuncle. Um, why that roof has to be that size, unless you were thinking of coming back at a later date uh, and and going for a, uh, a, a, an annex, it seems to me to be totally incongruous. And uh, I, I'm... Uh, uh, I'm disappointed uh, with what's happened here. Thank you, Councillor Mann. Councillor Bateman first, and I'll come to Councillor Mann. <coughs> to understand a little bit more about the previous um, permission to have a double garage, because presumably that permission kind of has quite significant bearing on why it is that you've thought that this was worthy of pursuing. And um, so I just want to dig a little bit more about that. Because, of course, if the this was rejected and it was appealed, presumably we could lose that if there was prior permission on that site for a double garage. Uh, yes, so there there is um, a, a permission on the site for a double garage. Um, the differences between what's there now and what's were that that was approved is one the siting, so it's it's further. To the west being closer to the listed building um, the roof form is slightly different which means it is higher um, part part of our consideration of the roof form is that it does reflect more of a traditional vernacular style um, and that is considered better reflective of of the designated heritage asset um, so that is something that we've considered acceptable <laughs> Yep. It, just to add in terms of appeal it, it, it you know this is one of those ones where it is a it is a balance um and it really is for members to 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 take that balanced view um in decision making and the previous permission presumably was for a closed garage and this is all open so so, so from that respect is an improvement uh, yeah that's right so um it, as can be seen from this slide here, that these are the drawings for the, the previous approval. So it would have been enclosed on three sides and then open at the front. Um, what is being proposed now, partly because of its location closer to the listed building, is to remove that eastern wall, which would allow some visibility um, through to the listed building and then the regrading of land toward the listed building, which would open up the views uh, to allow a better appreciation and understanding of the listed building. So in that in that sense, it's considered to be a benefit to the proposal and an improvement above what was um, what was previously proposed. Thank you, um, Councillor Mill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I used to live near here, so I know that walk very well, and I, I very totally agree with that. Uh, it's a beautiful walk, and this is just uh, destructive in in the extreme. Uh, it seems like the householder actually wants to lower the value of his own house, which is incredible, but there we go. Um, I just want to, uh, if officers could uh, uh, clarify <laughs> for me, in terms of the conservation area issue, to what extent can we use that to control the appearance of it? Because it is, it's a, it belongs in some suburban development, it's completely out of keeping, whether it's 100 yards from the house or, or wherever it is, it's, it's the, the design is just completely out of keeping. Can you what, what you know, what uh, abilities do we have to control it? Well, you, you would have to assess whether it's acceptable or not in planning terms, and part of that assessment would be its impact on the conservation area. So, it, it you know, it's for members to consider what that impact is. Is it positive? Is it neutral? Is it negative? That would need to be part of your considerations as as part of the application but yes the fact that it's in a conservation area is a material consideration of of significant weight so um if we were to ref, ref, refuse or you know <laughs> which i think uh, i'm very much minded to do um it would be on, on the grounds of uh, um, <coughs> uh the appearance not satisfying conservation area standards or what, what would the grounds be well that's for you councillors but um <laughs> um you know ultimately if you consider it's got a harmful impact on the character of the conservation area that that you know may be something you wish to consider if if you are considering put, putting forward an alternative motion 
Thank you. Councillor Bainham, apologies. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've had reference um, from a number of contributors, councillors here, um, to a concrete bunker. I haven't seen it. And, and what, what part of this is to do with the, with the application? Um, so, as can be seen from the photos here, uh, the concrete retaining walls are used because of the slope levels. So, I, I don't know how well you can see these photos, but at the moment there are concrete retaining walls to the north, east and west. Um, probably this bottom photo here is, is best representative of what's there now. Um, so those are in place to, to reinforce the ground because of the ground levels and then those would be finished in brick slips um, or an alternative material if that's proposed at this point. Yeah, so it wouldn't look like that with a with a wall because there would be earth on one side of it. Yeah. So that, uh, yeah, so if you look at the, the top photo, um, so the bottom photo is sort of a, a previous uh, image, but this is the current state of the site now. So they have sort of put the, put soil in to fill between yeah. the, the reinforced concrete walls and to sort of regrade the site to the west there. Um, and then the wall to the east here has been removed with land regraded toward the listed building as well. So, I mean, I, I do agree, it does look like a concrete bunker, um, but the, the plan is that it won't be at the end of it. So. Uh, that's correct. So currently it's proposed to um, fit brick slips onto the concrete so that it would appear as a brick wall. Thank you. Councillor Fisher, sorry, I'll come to you later. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I I've, um, agree with a lot of the comments and, and share a lot of the concerns around around this. Um, I, I'm really, if we could go back to the picture of it where, yeah, exactly that one. We will agree that a Range Rover is a very large vehicle in itself. And, and, the, and the roof is three times the size of that vehicle. What's the justification of that? I just can't understand unless they're planning to do something else. I think we, we have to consider whether the proposal before us is acceptable or not. And obviously part of that consideration is the height acceptable in the context of the listed building and the conservation area. It's not really for us to say necessarily what, what do we definitely need a justification for that height, but we can consider the impact of that height on the okay. conservation area in the listed building. I think that's where members should, so, should draw so, their so, thought. So for, for me, it clearly is a very detrimental impact on the conservation area, and that's what we should be protecting. Thank you. Councillor Trollope. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 equally, I, I'm minded to, to, to not approve this, but if uh, I tried to do so, the only way I can make myself vote yes would be there being a condition for the owners to somehow make it a little bit more in keeping. I mean, are, are there things they could do, like put at least some thatch on the, the garage roof instead, or put on a better set of tiling more in keeping with the area, uh, slated, you know, slates for the, the walls instead of the rather modern looking bricks? Is, is that a condition that we could impose? So there is already a condition regarding material. So I think you have to bear in mind that you've got a, an image representative representing the structure in front of you, but through those conditions, you can require alternative materials, both in terms of what's currently proposed in the brick slips and also what's on the roof. You know, it, it, that could be controlled by that condition. I, I would suggest it's probably unreasonable to require it to be thatched, bearing in mind the, 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 the building itself is not thatched, but it is open to that condition to consider different materials if members were otherwise minded to approve the, the scale and bulk of it. Uh, but it's my understanding the house used to be thatched, or am I incorrect on that? My understanding that it, permission was granted in 2019 for, for, for the current roof so, so that we have to be mindful of that in, in any you know future decision making that we make thank you okay. 
Sorry, as Councillor Pops. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. I was just going to ask if um, I can propose that we refuse this by virtue of it being contrary to HDPF policy 33 and causing unacceptable harm to the neighbouring neighbourhood amenity, and also um, contrary to obligations under the Council's conservation regulations. Thank you. We'll just check that. Thank you, Councillor Potts. Um, condition, certainly condition 33 is certainly a consideration in terms of its scale and massing. Obviously, we do have separate policies relating to conservation areas and listed buildings. So um, it, it would be useful just to clarify your reason for refusal in, in, in terms of what you're identifying the harm to be. Thank you. So it's, it's harmed by virtue of its, its mass and scale um, and on, the, of an overbearing nature. On what? What would the harm be on? On, on the listed building. I, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's what I was seeking to clarify. Thank you. We put forward. Do we have a seconder? <laughs> sorry, um, I, I didn't quite see. Sorry, I didn't quite see you raise your hand first. Sorry. Um, do we have? Um, can we take a vote on this motion, please? I think that's right. Yeah. So it's your expedited motion. Would it useful if we just clarify what the reason for refusal is before members vote on it? Okay. Um, the mass and scale and overbearing nature to the listed building and conservation area, contrary to policy 33 and 34. So harm to the, harm to, yeah. So Councillor Mill. Did we add in materials to that? I think the modern materials is another factor. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, who said local vernacular was at you, Councillor Potts? I, th I, think, I think obviously materials can be controlled by condition. So we need to be mindful of that, but the structure itself is something that we are considering. So Councillor Potts, if you wanted to add its country to the local vernacular to that, your motion, then we can consider that. Yeah, I'm happy to go along with um, Councillor Milner and add that, please. I'm just fine. Okay, can we take a vote on that motion, please? All in those in favour? Refusal, yes. Um, yeah, it's, sorry. It's, it's, are you voting? Yes. Yes, no, yes, that's right, yes. It's unanimous apart from Len at the moment. Oh, sorry. sorry. It's, it's, it's unanimous. Apologies. <laughs> I um, used the wrong phrase there, but motion, but carried. motion is carried. Thank you. Councillor Finnegan, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Can I just ask for clarity um, with regards to the, um, the the wall? Was that also listed and will that be reinstated? Thank you. Um, so, so is that the, the wall to the frontage of the site? Um, so my understanding, having spoken to the conservation officer, is that um, the wall was not considered to be curtilage listed um, because it did not um, it was not present in 1948, uh, so it wouldn't have been considered to fall under the listed building um, nature. Uh, it would have been considered as something as part of the conservation area, um, but I don't know the height of the wall in terms of whether or not uh, it would have, have been something that needed planning permission. Councillor Finnegan, we can come back to you on that uh, after the meeting once we've spoken to our compliance team and the conservation officer. Okay. Thank you. Um, item nine, urgent business. I understand there's no urgent business. So I will bring this meeting to a close at the time.